It was the 4th of July, a Thursday, and my roommate and I decided to go for a bicycle ride. Wednesday happens to be my day off, but since my job does not open for the holiday, I worked that Wednesday. So I would have the same amount of hours for that pay period. I thought it would be nice to go out. After all, I also had two free movie vouchers. My roommate has a pickup truck, making it convenient to carry our bikes. We head to an area that is about 30 miles from where we live. It's a beautiful upscale community that has nice roads and the gorgeous scenery that South Florida has to offer. Before I continue, I must sidetrack information to the listener. My boss's dad has recently left on a week-long cruise with his wife. At a certain point during their voyage, he tripped and fell. This caused him excruciating pain, and as a result, his family took him to the doctor where he was given horrible news. He had cancer, and it had spread throughout his body. For some unknown reason, the doctors never caught up to his illness during his regular checkups. Things deteriorated rapidly after that. Last thing I knew, he was being transferred to a different hospital, from West Palm to Miami. I must admit, I'm not that crazy about old people. They can be bitter and complain a lot. However, my boss's dad was a sweetheart and a joker. It was always pleasant to be around him. He was the type of person, just like his son, that everyone got along with. But now back to the story. As I'd said before, my roommate and I had headed out for a bike ride and the movies. We took a long trail along a major road in West Palm. That day being a national holiday, traffic wasn't bad, and I was using a single speed bike, and I could not keep up with my roommate's 19 speed bike. I stopped, sent him a text, and turned around. We agreed to meet where the truck was parked. I used the same road and stopped at a local Walgreens to buy something to drink. Remember, this is the middle of summer in Florida, and it can be very hot during the day. I continued on my bicycle ride, and when I was nearing a certain spot by a business plaza, a certain feeling fell upon me. It is not easy to explain, it was like a voice, but not in the sense of when you verbalize words to a person. Instead it was like a voice that seemed to have originated from within me. The voice told me to turn left. Next thing I know, I find myself turning left without even thinking about it. As I reached the parking lot on the plaza, I saw a female gathering shopping carts for the Whole Foods located at the plaza. I smiled and waved at her, and she smiled in return. Then her eyes got real big. Two seconds later, We heard the most horrible noise of tires squealing and then a loud bang. The sound of twisted metal, and I turned around, and to my surprise, there was a car crash. A four-door Toyota Corolla that was totaled, and an SUV in a really bad shape. For reasons I do not comprehend, they had crashed head-on. What struck me the most was that they had crashed at the very same spot I was about to cross with my bicycle. Needless to say, I would have been crushed between the two vehicles, and I would not have made it out alive. Now, going back to the subject of the old man. The next day, Friday the 5th of July, I returned to work. My boss looked pale and depressed. He seemed distant. Before I even say good morning, he tells me his father had passed away the day before. I ask him what time the old man died, And that's when things got strange. The old man had died a few minutes before I was about to cross that intersection. Coincidence? Maybe. Divine intervention? Well, I'd like to think so. After all, I wouldn't be alive if not for that voice that warned me about the upcoming danger. This experience taught me to always listen to that sixth sense gut feeling butterflies in your stomach, whatever you want to call it. This feeling is always right, and thus you should listen to it. One day, maybe it will even save your life. This man was a good person. Perhaps he was fond of me too, and decided that I was too young to perish. I live in Eastern Europe, more exactly in Romania. 
You may have heard about those gypsy witches that live in my country. Most of them are just pretending to be something they're not. This, however, is the story of a real witch. My grandmother used to live in the same village with a witch. I don't know if the witch was a gypsy or Romanian, but it doesn't really matter. She lived for so many years that no one knew her age. This woman claimed to be a witch, and she had also claimed that she had this demon who served her. She used to talk about the way she sold her soul one night in the forest while performing a ritual. In return, she gained powers and the help of a demon. She said that she couldn't die until she convinced someone to take full charge and responsibility of her duty as a witch and sell his or her soul to the darkness as well. She, I believe, had three daughters, but people said that their mother's behavior scared them away. They moved to Bucharest and never returned to the village. Now you will say that she was most likely a crazy old woman, but no. A lot of people heard weird noises coming from her attic, and she agreed that the sounds were made by her slave demon. People, even though afraid, asked her to solve their problems and gave her money for doing so. No one ever complained about her work. No one. Everything was put in place no matter how difficult the task was. People witnessed a lot of hard work getting done overnight in her yard and garden things that she wasn't able to do alone. My grandmother met a woman on her way to work. The woman asked my grandmother about the witch. She wanted to know where the witch lived. My grandma gave indications and then asked her why she was going to go see her. She said that a thief broke into her house and stole her savings and she wanted her money back. The next day, my grandmother met the woman again. She carried a bag and my grandma asked her what happened. She said that she went to the witch and received the promise that she would be able to find the money on the table when she returned home. The witch asked in advance for half the money. The woman agreed. It was better than nothing. And things happened exactly as the witch foretold. And she carried the promised money in the bag on the way to the witch's house. Another story is that a woman fell in love with a married man. She went to the witch and told her that she wanted that man. The witch asked her if she wanted the man no matter what the consequences were. She said yes, and in less than a month, his wife got ill and passed. He remarried, and he got married to the woman who asked for his wife to fall. That's why she was seen as a powerful and real witch. For sure, she had some supernatural powers. Unfortunately, I don't know if she's still alive. I work at a hotel in my town and was driving my husband's truck to work as he was taking mine to the shop to get serviced. He has a very large truck and I only drive it when I absolutely have to. When I pull into the side parking lot, I notice the entire lot is covered in snow and no one can see the lines for the spots. I look like a moron and try to park in what I hope is a spot, backing up and moving forward several times. When I finally park, I get out of the truck and grab my backpack. When I hear someone yelling from the sidewalk from behind the parking lot, you need to learn how to park. I'm embarrassed, but just close the truck door, lock it, and begin walking to the front of the building. Now, the hotel has a side entrance for employees, but it takes a code and I have a bad memory. So I just walk to the front and go through the main entrance and I hear the guy yell again. Did you hear me? I walk faster and take a peek behind me. The guy's following me. I keep walking, but call back. Please leave me alone, I need to get to work. Before I can reach the corner of the building and make my way to the entrance, the guy grabs my arm and spins me around. I'll never forget what this guy looked like for as long as I live. He wore dark clothes with a torn up winter coat. 
His eyes were bloodshot, and he smelled like a combination of cigarettes and whiskey. I guess he must have been drunk, but didn't slur at all when speaking. You're coming with me. The guy began dragging me back to the truck, and I tried to pull my arm away from him. Let go of me. Give me the key. We're taking a drive. I begin yelling for help, and his grip on my arm got tighter. I'm a 26-year-old woman, not skinny, but a lot smaller than this guy. He was dragging me easily, and the snow on the ground just made my feet slide along. Someone help, please! No one was near us, and I keep fighting to get away from this guy. I prayed that there would be guests that could possibly hear me, but it was our slow season, so most likely there'd be no one in the rooms on that side of the building. The guy turns back to glare at me. Shut up and give me the keys. Now, I was carrying my backpack on one shoulder, as it was big and bulky from my uniform and shoes. I quickly slipped the strap down my arm, grabbed it, and swung it right into his face. The guy let me go, and I just ran for my life to the front doors. I heard the guy screaming, but ignored him. I was way too scared to look back at him. I ran inside, and all the way to the employee locker room. When I finally calmed down enough, I went to the front desk to talk to security. Sadly, there were no cameras on that side of the building, so nothing was recorded. They called the cops and made a report. The cops informed the general manager of the hotel that they needed to seriously consider security cameras on that side of the building, as drunks and drug users were known to be in this area, as there was a bar just a few streets down. They got a description for the guy and said they would keep an eye out for him. The manager apologized like crazy about the incident, but I told him it wasn't his fault. He's a really good guy. I did ask the security guards to follow me out, so that I could check on the truck. Thankfully, it was fine. The security guard promised to make more rounds outside, especially that early in the morning. So I told my husband. He drove me to work the next day, and I was happy to see that security were keeping their word and they would make rounds outside that time of morning. They still currently are. I'm driving myself to work again, but I don't get out of my truck until I see the security guard. He watches to make sure I get in okay. I think he's also hoping to catch the guy if he comes back. The guy that covers him on his days off does the same thing. I'm gonna be obtaining pepper spray, perhaps something else after work today. I haven't heard from the police yet, and I may not. Hopefully the guy was scared off from coming back to this area. Or maybe he tried to go back, and the security guard scared him off. Either way, I hope to never see him again unless he's in handcuffs and being taken to jail. And thankfully, he didn't get my backpack. In any case, I hope to never meet him again. I attend a relatively small Christian college. This college has a very old, very large library, which I work at. I've been working at it going on about a year. So I've been here late at night and such. Now, despite being a Christian, I am rather skeptical in regards to spirits and ghosts, but I believe they are tricks of the mind. Now, I have a friend called Veronica and she is very in tune with spiritual things, most likely from her history of being attacked by spirits when she would visit her Wiccan father. She works at the library too, and even during the times when the library is mostly completely empty, she believes there's some kind of entity on the third floor, such that she actually does all in her power to avoid going up there alone. Now, I'd never thought anything about the third floor, but not too long after our discussion, I went up there alone very late at night. A lot of the aisles had lights off, and it was very dark outside. As I turned around, I saw something slip back into one of the aisles, and I quickly noped out of there. Since then, I have found some interesting developments. I found out the college is extremely old, and has been in existence for over 150 years. 120 or so spent at the current location. It also retains very old buildings, some being over a century old. I told everyone about the weird shadow creature on the third floor of the library, but now I have more information. 
I recently discovered that the building built in the early 1900s was at first a church before being remodeled into a library. This goes towards the history of the building. Next, I had another encounter. I was once again tasked with shelving books on the third floor and had to go down one of the side units. To describe it, imagine a big rectangle with two lines parallel and through the middle. Those lines are walkways and to the far right are study areas and the windows, letting in light and all the way to the left is bookshelves lit by lights. Now the way the lighting works on those side tracks is they have a big strip of tubes down the middle of the rows and you press a button which turns on the light and the timer. I've been told and have experienced that the timers for the lights stay on and should last an hour or so. That being said, I turn on the lights in the side stacks, head on it and start shelving books. When not a minute later, the lights flicker off. I then hear rapid footsteps walking away. I, of course, am already uncomfortable on the third floor, so I rush to see if it's a co-worker who knows it's me upstairs. Nope. I look two to three rows in the direction and see no one, nor any indication of a person. These rows are too big, so that means someone would have had to have dashed about 20 plus feet and hide in another black stack to have outrun me and it didn't sound like they were running. So I call it quits there and then and head back down, telling my supervisor that the shelves were too tight for the other books. Recently, however, she sent me to shelve books at least once a week, and some patron, God knows why, seems to solely take books from the third floor. To combat the skeptics who might say, it's a wiring issue or faulty lighting, we have had the campus maintenance team up there a handful of times and more for the stack and they can absolutely find nothing wrong with it. I've also been asking around and are not the only one who feels watched on the third floor. Not only this, one of my female friends went into one of the corners of the stacks looking for a book and felt the temperature drop down so much she began to shiver and almost fainted. This was when it was about 80 or so degrees outside. Up until junior year of high school, I flew mostly under the social radar and stuck to my status as a nerd girl. But when I was 15, I joined varsity cheer. My school's cheerleaders weren't popular by definition but everyone kind of knew who they were because we were on the announcements, performed at pep rallies, and generally engaged with the students a lot. I made a lot of friends that year, and some of them happened to be the cool kids. For a while, I thought this was my long-awaited karma payoff for the years of bullying I'd suffered at their hands. I even developed a crush on one of them, a crush which the junior cheer captain volunteered herself to help pursue. Homecoming is a big deal where I'm from, and I began to fantasize about my crush asking me to go with him. I'd heard rumors he was planning a dramatic proposal as homecoming season approached. I'd become more and more sure I would be his date, and the junior cheer captain who was close with him kept dropping hints that I was right. One day at practice, she asked me what my favorite candy was, and I knew it would be so my crush would know what to give me. You can imagine my surprise when after an exhausting theater rehearsal, I walked into the parking lot and was confronted by a guy I hardly spoken to asking me to be his date. My theater friends all applauded, assuming I was overjoyed. I saw both my parents in the parking lot recording the whole surprise, but most importantly, the cool kids I'd recently befriended were standing right there behind him, egging him on. I didn't understand why, because he wasn't popular at all. In fact, he was known to be kind of a creep. The junior cheer captain was laughing, encouraging him to give me the box of my favorite candy he was holding. She definitely orchestrated the whole thing. I didn't really know the guy but I didn't want to humiliate him in front of the coolest kids in school, so I faked a smile and rolled with it. 
and promised myself I'd deny him later in private so he wouldn't be embarrassed. Afterwards, when my parents excitedly asked me how I felt about the ordeal, I explained how uncomfortable it made me. I said that I got super creepy vibes from the guy. That didn't fly with my parents. My mother accused me of having expectations too high, and my father demanded to know, not for the first time, if I was secretly a lesbian. I had never had a boyfriend or shown much interest in dating. To make his case stronger, I'd just become best friends with the only openly gay girl our school had ever seen. Long story short, I knew that if I shut down my date, I'd effectively declare war on my parents. However, I played my dad's protective instinct against him and persuaded him to let me friendzone my date. After all, he knows how high school boys can think, right? I texted my date that night and explained that I only saw us as friends, but would still be happy to go to homecoming with him. He was very polite about it, although I could tell he was interested in me romantically. It seemed we'd reached a deal until the next day at school, when one of my cheerleader friends referred to my date as my boyfriend. I corrected her and told her we're just gonna homecoming as friends. She seemed confused and told me my date was telling anyone who would listen that I was his girlfriend. A few more of my friends approached me with similar comments and I confronted my date about them. He denied all involvement and suggested it was just a rumor. I reminded him that we were just friends and I had zero romantic interest in him. He said he understood. I got a call from the junior cheer captain. She pretended to be sweet and conspiratorial, but I was still annoyed that she'd led me to believe my crush would ask me to homecoming. She began her attempt to persuade me that I was wrong to friends on my date. She said that she'd spent many afternoons planning his proposal with him and she knew he was kind of creepy from afar, but was sweet and caring underneath it all. I said, if he was such a catch, she should date him. Annoyed, she dropped the sweet act. She told me I had to date him because he'd liked me so much and he'd gone to so much trouble to ask me for homecoming. I had to give him a chance because he had gone out on a limb for me. I told her she was wrong. I didn't have to do anything and I didn't want to and I owed him nothing. I ended up hanging up on her soon after, but that was just the beginning. Starting the next Monday, he would corner me in the hallway and give me a rose held in his teeth. He usually did so between my sixth and seventh period, when my path through the hall crossed his. I was deeply uncomfortable with this and told him so, but he wouldn't stop. I took different routes to escape him, but the junior cheer captain and her posse made a point of tracking me down so that he could find me everywhere. Every time he did this, everyone in the area would treat it as a sweet romantic gesture, despite my obvious discomfort. Wouldn't any girl be lucky to have a boy so devoted to give her a rose every day? He was still telling everyone I was his girlfriend. The final straw for me was when he walked into a class he wasn't in to find me and give me my daily rose. My teacher who was friends with the junior cheer captain let this happen. For weeks afterwards, she would ask me about my date every day. When he came in, I told him to get out and leave me alone. His feelings were clearly hurt and he left looking like a kicked puppy. My classmates had started calling me a cold, hard so-and-so. It didn't matter what I had to say about him. I was an ice queen refusing his sweet advances. Everyone in the school had decided that I was in love with him and nobody cared what I had to say about it. My crush, who was part of the popular group, joined the junior cheer captain in persuading me to return my date's feelings. At every event where the cheerleaders were present, my date would push his way in front of the crowd and would go to great lengths to get my attention. At football games, he would have a flag in the student section so I'd look at him where we were cheering. The other girls would make comments on how endearing he was when he waited in the parking lot by our bus back to the school, just to hug me and tell me how great I did. I didn't know what else to do other than let it happen. I had only recently ascended to a position of visibility. If I conflicted too hard with the cool kids who were so dead set on setting me up with this guy, 
I could be an outsider all over again. I just kept ranting to my real friends about how creepy he was, and publicly let him do what he wanted. It would all blow over. My school had a 15 second attention span, so some scandal had to one up me sooner or later. The truth emerged, as usual, in the locker room. It turns out the junior cheer captain had been telling him during their afternoons together that I was into him. He'd come to her for help announcing his crush on me. And she'd gone a step further and convinced him I felt the same, despite the fact I didn't even know his name. She'd lied to him for weeks prior to the homecoming proposal, and when I told her that she was wrong, she didn't care. She told me I should be grateful because everyone was starting to think I was gay. My best friend, the lesbian who was starting a gay revolution and I, inspired and spread a rumor that we were dating. After all, everyone already thought I was gay, right? But my date wasn't phased. In fact, he told everyone that he'd just turned me straight again. What? Three weeks after he asked me, it was finally homecoming night. Thanks to cheer obligations and a complete coincidence involving a switched backpack that left me without my dress, I ended up only attending the dance for half an hour. My date awkwardly stood on the side of the room while I danced my heart out to Mr. Brightside. I almost felt bad for him. Right at the end, the junior cheer captain appeared like a summoned demon to suggest we slow dance at the next opportunity. Thank God I escaped that one by walking to the DJ and suggesting he play Footloose. My date walked me to the parking lot to wait for my mum to pick me up. While we waited for her to drive around, which took entirely too long because she'd still hoped I'd stop making a fuss and date him, he asked me out, to which I politely declined. He quickly stammered that we could go with a group of people, like the junior cheer captain and my crush, I denied him again, and made it very clear that we were only friends, and I wasn't interested in romantic endeavors because I was too busy. That was actually true. I was in all advanced classes, varsity theater and cheer, and worked part time. A few days later, a teacher eloped to Vegas, and nobody cared about my love life anymore. My date and I were distance again by classes and activities and work. It appeared that everything was going back to normal. And that Friday at the football game, my crush asked me to sit on his shoulder for the alma mater. Kind of a romantic thing at the school. Overjoyed, I accepted, and I hoped this would be the beginning of a new chapter for me. I ignored the frantically waving flag in the stands. Monday, my date stood on a chair in his second period class and announced that everyone should be wary of my crush because he would steal your girl. I heard everyone buzzing about it a few hours later when someone called me something horrible for breaking my date's heart. I knew I was being dramatic, but I decided not to get lunch that day, afraid of running into him. I'm so glad I didn't. Later, I saw on Snapchat that my date had carved my name into his arm with a pair of scissors. His bleeding arm was screenshotted and sent to me by half a dozen people, most of them demanding why I'd hurt him like this. He did it in the middle of lunch in a crowded cafeteria, and somehow no administration either noticed or cared. The school was buzzing. My date was a broken-hearted victim, and I was the evil, secretly gay, awful girl who wouldn't give him a chance. I got so many dirty looks. By fifth period, I was just ready to walk out, but my good girl instincts kicked in and I decided to tough it out for two more hours. Around that time, I got a panicked text from one of my cheer friends. While she'd initially been insistent that I date the creepy guy, she'd apparently changed her mind after the lunch incident earlier. She told me that my date, who was in her fifth period class, was going off the rails. He had started out saying that he wanted to end his own life because I wouldn't love him. And this had escalated to saying that he would end my crush for lying to me and stealing me away. Finally, he started talking about how he knew where I lived. My parents had initially given him my address when he initially wanted to ask me to the dance at my house. 
and he would make me pay for wrongdoing him. I knew that after sixth period, our paths would cross the hall. Since the beginning of this ordeal, the school had cracked down on students getting outside, and my alternate route to escape him was no longer an option. My class was at the far end of the hall, with nowhere to go in this central hub, and he would be coming from the other end of the hallway towards mine. I was stuck up a chimney, basically. Desperate, I messaged the junior cheer captain to finish what she started, and tell him that I was not interested, had never been interested in him at all, and she'd made this mess, and I would make sure she had to clean it up. She said she'd go to the counsellor, but she didn't know what else to do, as this was now way beyond her control. For the first time, and only time, I skipped class. I hid out in the theatre hall and waited for seventh period. I got a few messages during the passing period that my date was waiting for me by the bathrooms. There was a little alcove, right where you can't see people coming around the corner, and the thought of him hiding there and waiting for me to walk by alone horrified me. Right before seventh period began, a few of my classmates burst in, cackling and proclaiming that my date was coming down the hall to finish the life of my crush. They thought this was hilarious. Judging by the look on my crush's face, this wasn't a joke to him anymore. Our teachers brushed it off as typical theatre drama, pun fully intended. And I watched the clock and tried not to cry, knowing that by the time the bell rang, my date would be outside, waiting for me and my crush to emerge. That day ended up being a work day, so my crush and I were able to escape the classroom and hide outside elsewhere in the theatre hall to get away from him. He opted for the black box theatre, and I went for the lighting closet. Obviously, I didn't witness what happened, but my best friend filled me in afterwards. Allegedly, my date had turned up three minutes before the bell rang and stood outside the classroom where we couldn't see him. When we opened the door, he told everyone standing around that he was ready to have a fight with my crush. And apparently, he had a weapon. We didn't know if this was true or not, but the idea that he might terrified me. His arm was wrapped in paper towels that he was bleeding through. My best friend told him my crush and I were gone, but he didn't believe her, and he stood outside for 25 minutes, until the administrators began walking through to make sure no one was still in the school who shouldn't be. My date wasn't in theatre, so he wasn't allowed to stick around. That night, I messaged him. Not only would I never date him, but could no longer even see a friendship between us. I sent him a number to a hotline and told him to get help. Finally, I told him he needed to learn what no meant, and I never wanted to speak to him again. He responded that he was sorry, and asked if there was anything he could do to fix this. I told him, no. I don't think he learned the meaning of the word after all, because the same pattern repeated itself a few months later down the line on Valentine's Day, and the next year at homecoming, senior year Valentine's Day, and prom. But these are other stories. I've since graduated, and gone off to college hundreds of miles away from him. My family back home moved from the address my parents gave him, and contrary to popular belief, I'm not gay. My crush, on the other hand, came out a few months later, and we were friends for the rest of high school. I'm working on handling romantic endeavours in a healthy way, but he got in my head. He was the first person to ever show an interest in me. Ironically, the last time I saw him was my first and only homecoming game after graduating. But this time, I had true friends to defend me when he predictably tried to pull some weird stuff. The worst part looking back was somehow being at fault for everything. To this day, people from my high school reference the whole ordeal as that time you wouldn't date that poor shy kid. I can't even appreciate red roses anymore. I've heard a lot of ghost stories growing up. I'm Italian, and my mother's family is from the south known to be far more superstitious than people are here in the north. Ghosts, haunted houses, desecrated churches, gnomes, elves living underground. Hearing all this kind of thing is commonplace in my family, 
and it can be a great source of fun during holiday gatherings, especially if you're a little bit drunk. This story, however, is different, in a way that spooks me to no end. My grandparents were both born a few years after the end of World War II, and they were both really young when they moved to Milan with their parents to study and work. There they met, had a kid and married at the age of 18. Living in such a vibrant environment, like the city of Milan was during the 60s and 70s, made them develop pretty liberal ideas. They joined the Italian Communist Party. My great great grandfather had been in the resistance, joined workers marches and unions, they were and still are both atheists. My grandma took part in women's union and the feminism movement. They are not the first two people I think of when we are talking about superstition and close encounters with the paranormal. And yet, when they were in their late twenties, they went on holiday to Tuscany, to a small farmhouse. Everything was perfect as you'd expect in a Tuscany holiday spot to be until it wasn't. During the night, they woke up in their rooms to the sound of steps and low chanting. They waited in the dark, surprised and terrified, as the door of their bedroom opened and a procession started to walk in. They looked like friars, clad in dark tunics with their hoods covering their faces, singing in Latin and carrying what looked like a coffin on their shoulders. They circled the bed, stood in front of my shaking grandparents until the song ended, and they left in the same way they'd come in. My grandparents waited until the spot was clear. They gathered their stuff and ran away at the speed of light, turning their car around in the direction of home, never to return again. To this day, I still haven't decided if they're playing an elaborate prank on all of us. If they took some sort of drug that night, and now they're too shameful to admit it. I think LSD was pretty common back then. Or if they were the ones getting pranked by a group of hilarious people who took it way too far. It's still insane to think about, and I can't help but feel uncomfortable at the genuine fear I think I can see in my very rational grandma's eyes when she tells the story, and my granddad's complete avoidance on this subject. I lived in the RGV, living in Edinburgh, but grew up in Rio Grande City my entire life. My grandma told me stories of her encounters with the Lechuza when I was a kid. I was usually skeptical of mystical tales, but when it came to my grandmother, I bought her stories. It wasn't until I had my own experience that I was fully invested in other old wives' tales and folklore. I was out at a friend's ranch north of Rio Grande City with my buddy and a cousin of mine, a mutual friend and my buddy's dad. We were putting up some fence posts and barbed wire so we can corral some stray cattle that had wandered onto the property and keep them there until we found the owner. The sun was setting, so we decided to call it a day. We built a bonfire close by and huddled up in an unfinished ranch hand's house basically a concrete slab surrounded by four walls and no roof. We were drinking and just shooting the breeze and telling stories from high school, when eventually we got to stories of the paranormal. My buddy is a huge skeptic, mostly because he's afraid of it. So he kept trying to steer the conversation away from ghosts and such. I decided to share a lechuza story my grandmother told me. Once I got to describing the creature, we heard an ungodly screech, almost ear piercing. We all turned to look in the direction of the screech, and before my eyes can adjust to the darkness, I hear my buddy screaming that it's a lechuza, and he hauls ass to the main ranch house a few hundred yards away. I turn back to the darkness and see a giant silhouette of an owl perched on one of the posts we had driven earlier in the day. It was massive. So naturally, I did one of the two things they tell you never to do. I whistled at it. This thing screeched again and spread out its wings. Its wingspan had to be in at least seven feet in each direction, so 14 feet. The fence posts were spaced about 16 feet apart 
and its wings almost spanned half the distance. Scared out of my mind, I pumped my chubby, tree-trunk thighs as hard as I could and ran. As I had the back door to the ranch house in view, I got to see my buddy run in and close the door behind him. My cousin and our friend got their moments later too, and I hadn't noticed they took off right after my buddy, and were kicking and pounding on the door nearly in tears. I get about halfway there and look back to the unfinished house and see the gigantic bird perched up on one of the walls, its face catching the moonlight as it cocks its head sideways, kind of how a dog does when they hear the owner make a strange sound. In the mere moment of its face being lit up, I swear I was able to make out human-like features with a bonfire lighting up the area behind it. I finally reach the ranch house and my buddy's dad opens the door and we're almost in tears. I rush in, close the door behind me, and my buddy's dad demands to know what's going on. Trying to catch my breath, I tell him with the others adding their points of view as well. We all look out the back door to see if it's still there and just try to convince ourselves that we saw a regular owl, and my buddy's dad called us some rude names between chuckles. We scanned the horizon, and I'm armed with a baseball bat I found at the back door, my buddy with his firearm, and there's no bird. We got back with flashlights, me, my bat, my cousin, and a few weapons. We got back with our equipment, and our friend stayed back at the ranch house. He was done for the night. We get back to the bonfire to snuff it out. Smokey the bear was always kind of an influence on me, and we investigate the surrounding area. My buddy's dad breaks off from the group to check out the fence post to make sure they're undisturbed while we just hang back to think what happened. After a bit, we go join my buddy's dad and find him standing in front of the post we had originally seen the lechos are perched on. We never told him which one specifically, so I was kind of surprised to see him at the one. And then we saw the claw marks. I had a first date with a girl. We had a happy hour dinner that went well, so we wanted to keep things going. There were a decent number of red flags flying, chief among them being her ex-boyfriend was a one percenter in a local bike gang and was in prison. But she was hot and I'm an idiot. So we wandered down the street to her favorite bar. At this point, she's a full on social butterfly, wandering the bar chatting to all the regulars. So instead of following her around like a puppy dog, I just saddle up at the bar and start talking to the group of guys next to me. Nice dudes, very chatty and amiable. Eventually a number of bikers pull up. Now I'm a bit concerned and ask my new friends if everything's cool since I've told them my situation. They reassure me that everything's fine and I'm welcome there. Maybe an hour later, I wander off to the bathroom, come back, and these dudes tell me in a concerned tone that I need to leave, now. To this day, I have no idea what happened, but there was no mistaking the urgency of their tone. So I promptly paid my tab and headed out to my car. I hadn't seen my date in a while, so I was a bit surprised when she came running out of the bar, jumped to the passenger seat and yelled, drive. No high speed chase or anything after that. But let's just say I was freaked the hell out. Let me start by stating I'm a 24 year old female and downloaded Tinder to see what it was all about. I didn't put too much into it though, I never took it seriously. I never take much seriously. Most of the things I do were for a laugh. I think I tend to forget that the internet is not a game and that there are real life people behind that screen. I get on the bus back home after a long day of running errands. I sit down and from the corner of my eye, notice a heavy set man staring at me. I'm used to being stared at, so I ignore him. Also note, my Tinder account has been officially terminated months ago. I sneeze, he says bless you, and I say thank you. He was a heavy set guy with full hair, green eyes and an olive complexion. He then hands me a tissue. It's clean, don't worry. And then he gives me a piece of gum, five gum to be exact. I say thank you and throw it in my backpack. 
One mile, he says. Based on how he speaks, I think he might be a little on the special side. His voice was slow and low. Huh? One mile. That was on your Tinder. It said you were one mile away. I recognize you. We spoke for a bit. Then you stopped chatting. He then gives me one of those chocolate balls that are wrapped in all fancy like red. I then nervously giggled and told him I deleted my account. To be honest, I didn't even remember chatting with him. I would just swipe right on any and everybody. He asked me repeatedly for my number and I gave it to him because I'm really bad at rejecting people in person. He immediately called me to confirm it was my number. And at this point, I got off at a different bus stop, close to home, but not too close and sped walked home. I threw away his candies, blocked his number and I really hope it was just a coincidence and that he wasn't trying to find me. This happened to me way back in my college life. I still live in Asia. I was in a boy's dormitory and it was a five story dormitory building. In front of our dormitory is the all girls dormitory. There the paranormal activity happened. The same building with us, five story two, same building plan since the owner of the dormitory is the same. It's like copy paste blueprints on each side of the road. I met this girl who was in that dormitory. We happened to see each other every morning and along the way to school, making me have an excuse to walk with her every morning. She's pretty and friendly, so knowing her wasn't that hard. We were also at the same university, just at a different program. I was in civil engineering and she was in chemical engineering. I'm a third grade college student while she's a fresh one. Let's say older college boy appeal better to freshman girls. So we get on the dating scene fast and got hooked up pretty quickly. I kind of befriended the night shift security and I know the security guard since I always greet him whenever I walk her every night. I bribed him one night so that I could stay up there. The dormitory have this strict rule of no visitors 24 hours and the girl's dormitory has a curfew of 10 p.m. to 5 a.m. but they lack CCTV. She didn't share a room, she rented the solo room which cost the same amount as what we pay for a room of four. Our first night was awesome but I had to go around 4 a.m. and return to my own dormitory. It was around 3.30 a.m. when I woke up and got ready to go outside. I didn't wake her since we still had class later. I got out of her room, then in the hallway. On my right is straight on their toilet, which is shared, then on my left was leading to stairs. I was about to go down the stairs when I heard a door opening. So I ducked, quickly walked down the stairs slowly. I didn't want to cause a noise. She's in the fourth floor, so I have a long way to go. I was at the middle of a landing of the stairs leading to the third floor. When someone called me, hey, I got startled and looked up. There wasn't anyone there. I figured it out that it could be her. Her voice is like whispering or somehow low with a kind of horsey husk. I went upstairs again to look, but there's no one there. I got some chills, but it was almost 4 a.m. and security shift is around 4.30. So I headed down. Then again, I was in the landing and I heard her voice two consecutive times. I went upstairs again, but there's no one. I turn around and say, screw it. Run to the second floor and I heard it again, a chuckle or giggle. And I rushed to the ground floor, saw the security guard sleeping and passed him and went straight to my own door. I woke up late, missed two classes that day and several phone calls from her and my friends. My dorm mates didn't wake me. I called her and asked her to meet me at this fast food place where we usually eat lunch and explained everything that happened. She told me it was the ghost of the girl who ended her life tragically in that building. Well, I got creeped out by that. She told me that the girl did it because she got pregnant and her lover left her. Depressed and afraid of her parents, she ended her own life. I asked her where she got the info from and she said that the janitor told her about it. From that day onwards, I didn't return to her dorm. 
I didn't take my chances of seeing that ghost girl again. When I was nine, my sister was the victim of a hit and run. This happened right up the road from where we lived, two houses up to be exact. About a year after her passing, I was walking across the street two houses up, when I heard my name yelled very loudly. I stopped and looked behind me. No one was there. When I turned around, there was a car in front of me. It was passing me, and the woman driving clearly didn't see me. She was looking at the radio. She drove past me and I finished crossing the street. There is no doubt in my mind that if I hadn't stopped, I would have been hit by her car. I looked and never saw anyone outside or at the window. I never figured out who it was who yelled my name. Could it have been an echo of my sister? This happened to my uncle's wife. I will narrate it how she did to me and my sisters. We're from the northern state of Mexico, Nuevo Leon, from a small town south of Monterrey, around El Cierro de la Silla. If you've never heard of it, do Google it, it's beautiful. Stories about people seeing witches and lechuzas around the town are very common, but my aunt's story really pulls a chill down my spine. The story goes like this. I lived in a small home up in the hills. I shared a room with my sister, our windows facing the main street. It was big, and it had rails on the window. One night, me and my sister were in bed. She was asleep, and I was awake, lying on my bed, looking outside my window, since my bed was against the wall and right underneath the window. I liked opening the window and looking up at the sky. I remembered being around 3 a.m., when I decided that I had to get some rest. I stood up just to close my window, and that's when I saw her, the witch, flying right in front of my house. She saw me, and we made eye contact, and I immediately shut my window and got under my covers and started praying. I eventually fell asleep, and awoke to the fresh air hitting my face as I opened my eyes, and I see my head sticking out the window. I scream as loud as I could, and my sister woke up to help me. I'd never been afraid like I had been at that moment in all my life, as I realized that it was only her power that caused me to look out my window like that. If it wasn't for the rails, she would have had me. My aunt told us that her grandma would tell that the witches would take kids out their windows at night, and she never believed her until it happened to her. She believed the witch wanted revenge because my aunt made eye contact with her. The crazy part is that until this day, she sometimes wakes up with random bruises or hickey marks on her skin. Well, that's her story. This happened about 12 years ago. I was somewhere between 10 and 12 years old. The house my family lived in at the time was a block away from a canyon that runs through my town. The canyon is pretty much all lava rock, as we are near a lot of mountains. This canyon has a paved walking trail going from end to end, as well as a dog park, a skate park, tennis courts and softball fields, and some playgrounds here and there in the more populated areas in the center and south of the canyon. Not an uncommon place for people to spend time. Our house was at the north end of the canyon, where those populated locations are sparse, and it's mostly just the walking paths and a water treatment plant. This canyon is also pretty heavily wooded in the area we were near. That all being said, my friends and my siblings and I, all girls, used to go down there all the time in the summer, specifically to this one spot we called the roller coaster. Basically, it was a section of a small dirt walking path opposite to the side of the canyon that the paved walking path was on that dipped up and down kind of like a half pipe. We liked to run up and down it and see how much speed we could gain. So 
We're there one summer's day, running up and down and back and forth, timing each other to see how fast we could run and back up to the other side. When my turn comes up, my friend counts down and I take off down the hill. When I get to the bottom, right before I start to run up to the other side of the half pipe shaped dip in the path, I hear a loud thump on the dirt behind me and I feel the ground shake under my feet a little. I stop dead in my tracks and turn around to see what it was. It was a rock or boulder about the size of a basketball. Freaked out that this thing almost landed on me, I scan up the canyon wall to see where it came from, only to have my eyes land on two men sitting in the rocks on the canyon wall about 50 feet up. One is looking down at me, smiling. His smile is something I can picture to this day. It was so sinister. He had clearly just thrown this giant rock down at me, and he'd clearly been watching us run back and forth waiting for his opportunity. I decided to finish out the roller coaster as to not scare my friends and little sister. When I get back, they start teasing me about how long it took me to return since I stopped mid run. They asked where the rock came from and I said it must have fallen from the canyon wall and that we should go because more might fall and it probably isn't safe. My friends and sister are bummed but agree and I somehow convinced them we should run home. I wanted to get out of there and I'm secretly terrified these men will follow us. When we get home, I don't say anything to my parents as I'm afraid I'll get in trouble. I never go back to that spot and made up excuses when my friends and siblings suggested it. I'll never forget that man's smile. I never understand why he would do what he did, but I still get freaked out about what would have happened if I'd have taken off down the hill a second later or if they had followed us after I spotted them. So to the man who was throwing basketball sized chunks of lava rock, let's not meet again. Last month, I moved to another country where I didn't know nearly anyone. Due to that, I spent a lot of time alone and got bored. Although I didn't and don't like the concept of Tinder, I decided to create an account to meet people and spent hours swiping left and right and having brief conversations with my matches. However, most of them were men that wanted to see me on that same day, which scared me a bit. Our story begins when I matched with a 30 year old girl who didn't wait too long to send me a hi nor ask me for a phone number. I, who have never used the app before, thought it was normal and gave my phone number to her without having spoken at all. That was my first mistake. At first, everything seemed normal. The girl was called Diana and sent me voice notes. We spoke briefly and in a superficial way about ourselves. She seemed very interested in talking to me since on several occasions, she would double text me when I didn't answer quickly. And I'm not gonna lie, I found that curious. However, I paid it no mind. The second day of speaking to her, she asked me to meet her somewhere. And even though our conversations had been very superficial, I agreed and we set a place in an hour. But before we met, I regretted it. I deleted Tinder, messaged her an apology, and that was where things got weird. She let me know it was fine, but a few minutes later sent me several messages and deleted them within a second so I couldn't read them. A few hours later, she tried video calling me. I didn't answer and told her I was busy. In despite to that, she called me again and again, and I kept saying I was busy, but she didn't stop until about 2 a.m. By that time, she was either drunk and I blocked her. She called me twice at 2 a.m. By that time, I was out and drunk and blocked her. I felt a little bad about it, but come on, I'm a woman in her early 20s living in a foreign country. So at the same time, I felt relief that it was over except that it wasn't. I wake up to a hello from an unknown number, which profile picture in WhatsApp was one of an old man. I asked him who he was and in less than a minute received a reply saying it's Diana, that it's her dad's number. Why did I block her and if I annoyed her? In spite of how bizarre that was, I tried to emphasize with her and answered with truth. 
and she told me it was fine, and I blocked her dad's number. In less than two hours, I got another message from another unknown number. It was Diana again, asking why I kept blocking her, and that she needed to talk to me. At this point, it was no longer funny. I told her I'm not interested in talking to her, and she literally says, I need to tell you something. There's a girl who's harassing me. She does black magic. I repeated that I'm not interested, and she goes on like, you don't believe me, don't you? And I block her again for a third time. I don't really know if this was some kind of strange joke, but I think I can say that my first experience using Tinder was tragic. I wonder if it's always this way, though I've never really thought about downloading it again. At least I know that next time I shouldn't share my phone number with someone I haven't spoken to. Let's hope for the best. I never meet you, Diana. I studied abroad in Oxfordshire, England in 2012 and lived in an abbey that was built in 1215. On this day, it was a beautiful sunny day and for some reason, I was the only one in the abbey. It was a small group of us studying here, maybe 40 to 45 altogether. I was in the library sitting on a couch located under a window that was across the room from a wall with a fireplace. The door in the library to the left of the fireplace and I was reading a book for class when suddenly, over the top of my book in my peripheral, I saw a man walk into the room with me. He walked by the fireplace and was continuing into the room. He was a tall man, and what I noticed immediately was that he was wearing a full suit. My first thought was that it was very early morning or late afternoon, and I wondered who the heck is wearing a suit right now. I looked up from my book to acknowledge him, and no one was there. I was completely alone in the room. I got goosebumps, and my heart beat harder in my chest. But I wasn't terrified or anything. I just kind of went, okay, and kept reading my book. I had forgotten about it until a few nights later, when a friend of mine told me the receptionist had been telling her ghost stories about the Abbey. One of the stories had been that when it was quiet in the library, students reported seeing a butler walking around. A butler. I flushed bright red when she told me, and I immediately thought of the man in the suit. I went back to the library a few more times on my own when I studied there, but I never saw him again. I am a woman in my 60s. I come from country redneck farm stock. While I have a good imagination, and I'm very creative, I live firmly grounded in reality with a non-denominational Christian belief system. I grew up knowing spirits were real, both evil and good. I technically don't believe in ghosts as the shades of dead people floating around doing things because my belief system says that when you die, you go to one of two places, heaven or hell. I live in a very small neighborhood in Alaska. It's a cul-de-sac with only five houses on it. My husband and I have lived here for several decades. At the time, my scary experiences happened and we were well acquainted with all the neighbors. Times have changed since then, and now we are only passing acquaintances with most of them. It's a quiet neighborhood where everyone respects everyone else's privacy, but will step in to help any time it's needed. As some of you might know, in the summer, Alaska has a great deal of sunlight. At midnight in the summer, it's still light enough out to read a book outside and easily identify things even from a distance. It's like twilight in the lower 48. So many unexplainable things have happened in this neighborhood that I can only choose three of the most vivid to tell you. All three episodes remain unexplained to this day. The first one occurred during a summer night. It was almost midnight, and I was standing in my backyard having a final cigarette, accompanied by one of my dogs, an elderly, very gentle golden retriever mix. A movement at my neighbor's house caught my eye, 
and then my little girl growled. That was unusual for her. I looked at my neighbor's house and saw a person wearing blue jeans and a yellow jacket crouching by her car, apparently peering in with their hands cupped to the glass. I stepped forward to ask her what she was doing, worried that perhaps she'd lock herself out. And although I had extra keys to everyone's house, she didn't want to wake me up that late. As I moved forward, the figure straightened up and moved towards the rear of the car. It didn't walk, it flowed. Without the up and down motion of walking, as if it reached the rear of the car, it exploded into a yellow mist and vanished. I stood there stunned. My cigarette burnt down unnoticed while I stared and squinted. I tried to make sense of what had happened. My little dog was pressed against my legs shivering. Since it was so late, I didn't want to disturb the neighbor. So I went back inside to bed. The next day, I waited until she got home from work, but thought better of saying anything just yet. I needed to try and debunk or explain what had happened. That night, I went out at the same time of night with the same dog, stood in the same spot and lit a cigarette. Nothing happened. Her car stood serenely in place in the last rays of sun setting on it. No figures moved, no bushes were in the way. There was nothing that I could see that explained what happened. The dog was unmarried. I eventually told her what had happened and she wasn't surprised at all. Rather, a bit relieved that someone else had finally seen something. The second episode happened in the winter where the lighting is the opposite. It's dark most of the day. My pickup truck was parked in our driveway. I had brought several bags of dog food earlier that day. That summer, I had fallen over a dog and broken a finger on each hand and had just recently had another several surgeries. I went to feed the dogs and realized I had forgotten to bring a bag of dog food in. Being an independent sort, I didn't ask my husband to get the food, but shoved on a coat and some boots and went out of the truck. I'm only five feet tall, so getting something out the back of a four-wheeler drive truck isn't exactly easy. I switched on the outside light, walked past our Mustang that was parked in the car spot. I struggled with the tailgate of my truck one-handed and poured the bag of dog food out the back to the ground. As I reached back to close the tailgate, I looked up to see a man wearing jeans and a t-shirt standing beside the Mustang watching me. Of course, I assumed it was my husband who had come out to help. And when I got the tailgate shut, I looked back to make a sarcastic comment about his timing. No one was there. The light was still on. The driveway carport and my truck were brightly illuminated. I still thought maybe he'd just gone inside because, you know, winter and he didn't have any outdoor gear on. I managed to haul the bag to my shoulder and trudge into the house. To my surprise, he was sitting on the couch watching hockey wearing a tank top and shorts, not being outside watching me get dog food wearing jeans and a shirt. The third thing happened during the summer, but it was the daytime. It was hot and I was in my yard lounging in the shade wearing shorts barefoot. All at once, I heard what sounded like a very close gunshot. It echoed off the mountains. I went out through the back gate without stopping to put on shoes as one of my neighbors emerged from her house. We conferred and decided where we thought the shot had come from and began walking in that direction. We noticed another neighbor standing in his backyard, looking in that same direction. So we all went over to speak to him. We were all lightly clad because of summer. To Alaskans, 60 degrees is a heat wave. I was still barefoot. We joined him in his yard and conferred further upon the matter to see perhaps if we needed to offer help to the yet unknown victim. However, there was no further commotion and we decided it must have been a firecracker or a backfire. And we all three turned at the same time to walk back to the front of the house. Because I was barefoot, I paused for a second to look down 
to make sure I wasn't going to step on a rock or something, and a strange dreamlike feeling overcame me. I looked up and saw my two neighbours already walking up beside the end of the house. In front of them, I saw another woman oddly dressed in a mid-calf blue denim skirt, knee-high winter boots and a blue down jacket. My two companions disappeared around the corner and I followed expecting to see this third woman and wondered why she was dressed in winter gear on such a hot day. I was close enough behind them that there's no possible way for her to go anywhere else except right in front of them. There was no other woman. I looked at both neighbours puzzled and asked, did anyone else just walk around the corner, a woman wearing a winter coat? They both looked at me like I'd grown a second head and said no. We discussed it briefly, but the neighbour who lived there met my eyes and seemed uncomfortable. So I dropped the issue. Later, I discussed it with the neighbour I had walked over with but she had not seen anything and thought perhaps I had seen someone in the distance. But we both knew that that wasn't what happened because there were trees all around us and there's no distance in which anyone can see. It has been years since these things happened and I still have no explanation. Many other small things have occurred over the years that I can't explain or debunk, but these were the three most dramatic. Norwich is an old medieval city in England and has lots of beautiful and interesting old places to visit. One of its most famous buildings is the towering Norwich Cathedral opposite Tomland, which sits down by the river Wensum. Anyhow, busy exploring my new city one Saturday, I visited the cathedral and after wandering the building, decided to explore the cathedral close. It was late a sunny afternoon in October with lots of autumn leaves on the ground and I was really enjoying my walk when I stumbled upon a cobbled alley at the end of some houses and decided to see where it led. The floor and walls were cobbled and the walls maybe 10 foot high so I couldn't see over them but I could hear people in the gardens on the other side talking and children playing. Although I was on my own in the alleyway, I didn't feel alone but as I began to walk on, the alley began to twist and turn, and although the sky was blue overhead and the sun was still out, I began to feel increasingly uneasy. I could no longer hear voices coming from the other side of the walls, and when I thought about it, realized that in fact, I couldn't hear anything. No birds, no traffic, not even wind, and yet the cathedral is in the middle of a reasonably sized city. I began to feel nervous and my scalp started to prick. And so I began to up my pace, telling myself that I'd been walking a while and that the alleyway couldn't go on forever. But as I turned each blind bend, hoping to see the end of what was beginning to feel like a maze, I was only met with another stretch of alleyway. I began to jog, and although I hadn't seen anyone since entering the alleyway and couldn't hear any footsteps on the cobbles behind me, I had the growing sensation that someone or something bad was following me close behind and that the walls were pressing on. I started having difficulty breathing and realized I was also beginning to feel dizzy. I didn't want to pass out alone in this alleyway and so decided to run. After what seemed like forever, I turned another corner and suddenly sprinted out onto a perfectly normal looking street down by the river and the city sounds return. I realized I was shaking, my hand and forehead dripping with sweat and didn't have a clue where I was. I sat down on a wall and had a cigarette and pulled myself together and then stopped to pass a by and asked for directions back to the market square in the middle of town from where I could find my own way back to campus. It didn't take long to walk back to the market square, but when I checked my watch, it turned out that I had been in the alleyway for nearly an hour. It didn't make any sense, as I couldn't have walked that far, but I didn't want to know too much about it and told myself that maybe it was all the twists and turns the alley had, and that added to the time. At class on Monday, I was telling a few people about the alleyway in the cathedral grounds 
and how it had suddenly turned really spooky when one of the mature students on our course, who had lived in Norwich for years and knew a lot about its history, overheard me. She asked me if the alley was an old cobbled one with high walls that led off the cathedral close, and I said yes. She took me aside and quietly explained to me that she wasn't surprised I'd felt what I did, because that was the alleyway they dragged people accused of witchcraft along before burning them at the stake, as Norwich has a huge history of witches. But the kicker to this story is that though I lived in Norwich for a number of years and often visited the cathedral, I never walked that alleyway again because of what happened, until that afternoon one day, when a friend from overseas was visiting. I took her down to the cathedral, and while there told her about the alleyway and what I'd experienced, she insisted that we walk it, and when I stalled and started to make excuses, promised me that if things started to go bad, we would just turn back, and she would stay with me at all times. Reluctantly, I agreed. The alley was just how I remembered it, at first. Dry cobbled floor and high cobbled walls backing onto people's gardens. But after ten minutes at most, and only a handful of turns, suddenly we found ourselves back onto the street. It didn't make any sense to me back then, and it still doesn't to this day. And I don't go near the witch's walk anymore. I am a 25 year old woman who currently lives in England. I live in a countryside setting and around two hours away from the heart of Cambridgeshire. I live on the end house of a row of houses with my two older siblings and parents. I have mousy brown hair, blue eyes, and five foot five, and currently weigh 140 pounds, so I'm not the skinniest of girls. I've been told by many people that I look at youngest 17 to 18. This detail will be important later in the story. So here we go. I'm going to start by saying this is where it all started, back in June of 2019. The past few weeks had been very good weather, and my mum told me previously that she had planned for our relatives to come around for a barbecue. This included my auntie, uncle, and cousin with their kids, and other halves. So yeah, it was a big get together. So I had started to plan to make the garden look a bit better, as we will have a barbecue outside, so that meant painting, weeding, planting, and flowers. I have to do all this back-to-back -back work in the evening, as I work very early to midday, and I'm usually back around three o'clock. But it was summer, and the sun was out till late, so it wasn't much of an issue. Now, as I previously mentioned, we were at the end house, and our next door neighbor who owns her house, we do not, she rents her room out to tenants, which their window looks out into our garden. So in June, every other day, me and my family, once we had finished work, would notice a man. He'd be looking out of the window that is located nearest to the garden fence. He would be staring down at us. We are the kind of family that don't give it too much thought, so ignored him, thinking maybe he was a new tenant that had moved in just getting used to his new surroundings. But for a few days, I would notice that when I came home and started gardening, he would stare at me from his window, therefore making me slightly uncomfortable. But I still tried to not let it get to me. And maybe I was being over paranoid. A few days pass of him just staring at me until one day I was coming in through the front door. And he was also outside and went, Hi, my name's Dave, the nosy neighbor at the window. I awkwardly nodded my head and replied, Hi, Dave, I'm Charlotte. I completely felt sick to my stomach when he smirked and looked at me from top to bottom. I let out a cough in nervousness and then splutter out. I have to go to dinner. Bye. Before he can reply, I rush into the house, feeling very shaky. I again just shake this feeling off and carry on with my day. And that is until the evening when I let my dog out into the back garden. I'm realizing he is leaning out of the window. 
I ignore him by turning my back in that direction, silently praying that he will not talk to me. That's when he pipes up going, Hey Charlotte. I let out a sigh, cursing my inability to be rude. You see, I'm the type of person who does not like confrontation. I have a lot of patience and just don't like to be rude. Hi, I reply awkwardly. He smiles again and I feel my stomach eat itself. So would you go on a date with me? I stand there completely frozen. Dave is 60, at least, bald head, tattoos on his arms. I also put in here that when he is always out the window, he never wears a shirt. He has sunken eyes and is extremely skinny. I looked at him uncomfortably and shake my head. Look, I'm sorry, I'm not interested. He gives me a smirk before going, not even for a meal, he pushes. I shake my head. Look, sorry, I'm not interested, I say politely. Not even for a drink, he says. I grip my teeth. I'm standing there thinking, what the hell is wrong with this dude? Can't he take a hint? I again reiterate I'm not interested and turn away hoping to cut his conversation short. Am I making you uncomfortable? Can I say hi? I spin my head and give him a, are you kidding me? Look and narrow my eyes. You can say hi, but if you keep asking me out, then yes, it's gonna make me feel uncomfortable. I turn away from him and this is when he continually calls my name. I just ignore him, hoping he'll get the hint and go. But this is where I hear someone to tell him to get down from the window. I will also make everyone aware that my neighbor who owns the house was currently in surgery and she's elderly. So I don't blame her for all the events following as I don't think she could have helped in any way either. A few days passed and it was now July. Every single day that I'm outside doing the garden, which was around two hours each, he is always staring out the window at me or he is lurking just behind the curtain so he thinks I can't see him. I start to dread going outside every day and begin to feel trapped. This is when I tell my family and my mum and dad decide to have a chat with him. So my mum is like all mama bear going next door and she's the kind of person that is scary because she is calm. So yeah, you don't wanna mess with her. They come back and tell me that he has said he is so sorry, I didn't mean to make me uncomfortable and he won't do it again. Basically saying all the stuff they know they want to hear. But for the next few days, it doesn't stop. He is again still at the window staring at me and it's gotten so bad that when I tap on my living room window, my sister knows that he's there and for her to come out. This is the time when he also puts up some blinds and I can't tell if he's looking through the blinds at me. I also start to experience trouble with sleeping and panic attacks as the situation is stressing me out so bad. The next incident that happens was again, all the family got home from work at the same time and we started to put the cars in the garden. We have our own driveway in our back garden as the garden is huge. I was absolutely dying to go to the toilet so mom seeing this gave me the front door key. I ran around the front door about to put the key in the front door when I heard that next door's door had opened. I look up and see Dave smirking at me. My heart just about stopped and I felt an overwhelming feeling to run away. Seconds later, my brother was by my side. Instead of going into the front door, we ran back to the back garden to go in the back way. Unknown to me at the time, my mum had seen Dave jump down from the window when he saw that I was going to the front door. My mum then shouted for my brother to follow. Within the next few weeks, the evening stayed the same with me gardening and him staring. My sibling would often come out with me, but he would disappear and reappear if they went indoors. Another day of me gardening. And my brother was outside in the garden as well as was the creep staring out of the window. My legs started shaking 
and I honestly thought that they would collapse underneath me. My nerves felt like they were eating me alive, and I felt like I was on the brink of another panic attack. Bro, I'm gonna go start the front garden. He nodded, replying he would come with me to keep me company. Once we started doing the front garden, Dave came out with a handful of rubbish four times while looking at me up and down. I thought I was gonna break down crying. I'm standing there just screaming. Why won't he leave me alone? I told him I'm not interested, just leave me alone. I look away and concentrate at the leaves and putting in bags. Dave then proceeds to walk out, slam the door in the opposite direction and down the street. The way our houses are set up is that it's basically like a small estate. So you can do a lap around the houses and you will walk past our house. I'm cleaning the leaves and mentally in my head, I'm thinking he's going to pass the block and walk past us. And lo and behold, 10 minutes later, he walks straight past our gate and goes, how you two doing? I ignore his attempts at talking as I feel my blood rush into my ears and my heart would not stop pumping. I look at my brother and he gives me a concerned look. The next day, I'm sitting in the garden and I get a picture of him looking out the window staring at me. This was for future evidence for the police. After a few days of him lurking at his windows, I'd had enough and called the non-emergency police line. They said they would be out that evening, Saturday around eight, and two officers came and I explained the whole situation. I won't bore you with the details, but I broke down crying and all they said was it was suspicious him looking out the window, but there wasn't a lot they could do. They said they would look into it, but I never heard back from them. There I was sitting like a prisoner in my own home. I couldn't even go into my own garden without feeling uncomfortable because I knew he would be lurking there. A few more days carried on with the same routine, but this time I only went out for around 20 minutes because I was just too scared to go into my own garden. My panic attacks had started to worsen and I was having one nearly every day. I was getting sleep paralysis and I would see him standing at the end of my bed. I was having mood swings where one day I would be feeling all right and then an hour later be in tears because I couldn't cope with the constant paranoia. Even when I did laugh and smile, it was fake because the stress was overwhelming and I couldn't be myself. Even the shakes I had were uncontrollable. Then the following Friday it was pouring down with rain and I was finishing the last bits as the barbecue was two weeks away. And again, I was outside but this time I had to plant a sunflower below his window. I felt his eyes piercing through the back of my head. I started to uncontrollably shake and my heart was pounding in my ears. I couldn't take it anymore. Could he just leave me alone? I knocked on the window to get my sister to come out and she started to help me. I heard him cough above us and I snapped. My previous being polite attitude went out the window I met his eyes. Would you stop looking at me? I yelled. He had a split second of shock on his face before he came back to his senses and frowned. I could look out my window if I want. I gritted my teeth, the nerve of him. Yes, but you always are staring at me. Just leave me alone. I have the right to look out the window. I don't care. I can and I will. I saw my sister's face turn sour. You're looking at her whenever she goes. You don't stop gawking. I hear the anger in her voice, but I'm more concentrated on trying to calm myself down. Piss off, he yells, disappearing from sight. I grip my teeth, trying to push the tears down. What is his problem? A minute later, he returns to the window and says loudly, I've had a look on Google. It says here I have the right to look out my windows. I know my rights. We both reply, mm-hmm. But he's staring at me, which is making me even more uncomfortable. And I've already told him to stop. He then proceeds to tell my sister to piss off, as well as a few other things. 
This is when I yell at him. Excuse me? What did you just say? This argument proceeds with my family coming out and my mother telling him to get down or she will call the police as he is harassing us. And he tells her to piss off, as well as a few other horrible things that I don't want to repeat. You know, very colorful language. She says she'll call the police and we all run inside. This argument was a bit longer, but I cannot remember all of the details as it was just a few months ago and everyone was yelling in the heat of the moment. We do just that, and the local police said they'd be around next day, Saturday. The next day around three o'clock, the police come, and they seem to take it a bit more seriously. I said I had previously reported it, and big surprise the other police officers had not put it on record. The police officer Jenny told me to explain everything. I did, and when she asked me the question, what would you like to happen? I couldn't hold it in and broke down. I just said, I want him to stop. I don't know how to make it stop. I couldn't handle the stress anymore. After a long discussion, she said she was going to look into it. And I nodded, not really expecting much. But the next day, she called me and asked if I would be willing to write a statement, which I did. The next day was Monday. And this was when I wrote my statement. And when I was told, he was a registered offender, he would be arrested the following morning for stalking and harassment. I was so relieved, but I did not know that this was going on for a few more months. The following day, they arrested him at 8 a.m. I felt a little lighthearted, and I saw them break down the door and drag him away in cuffs in the police car. That evening, I also learned his full name, which I looked up. I went on to do research and found out he spent 10 years in prison for grooming a 13 year old. This brings me to the last five months. I was told I was being summoned to court in October. The arrest happened in August. So a few months of worrying slash paranoia, although he was out on bail, but was not allowed in my village or anywhere near me. When October rolled around, I was a bundle of nerves. So I'm sitting in the waiting area of witnesses. Everything's a blur, and I just want all of this to be over. The prosecutor then comes into the room with a crestfallen look on his face and sadly tells me that my case has been adjourned and the case will have to be booked. I again break down and can't believe my luck. He's walking the streets and he could be terrorizing another young girl. I'm then told the next court date will be February. And this brings me to the past two weeks. I get to court again. This time, I don't really feel like being a witness, but I know it's better for my case if I do. They usually start around nine, but are late. So they say it will start at 10. 10 rolls around, then 10.30, then 11, then 11.15. I'm starting to get worried again. What if it's adjourned again? I won't be able to have the guts to come next time. I see the prosecutor come in and I hold my breath. He smiles, he pleaded guilty. I let out a squeal and a half sob. It's all over. This is when he tells me more that I was not aware of. Two months before he moved into the house next door, he assaulted three girls underage. And every year before that, he has done something similar. I'm gobsmacked. Why the hell is he still on the streets? He then tells me, Charlotte, Earlier I asked you how old you were. It's because you look very young for your age, and the way he was approaching you is similar to the way he approached the other girls. I stare at him but nod my head silently. I didn't realize how close to danger I had become. It's so frightening. I've just found out he got sentenced to eight months. Not as much as I would have liked to considering the nightmare he put me through, and those poor other girls. Though, he's got two years probation, community service, and unpaid work. I also have a restraining order, which I'm very pleased about. So yeah, I'm wanted to share this for ages. Everyone out there, be safe and always trust your gut. If you feel unsafe, always tell someone, even if you feel silly about it. And to Dave, who put me through seven months of hell, you most likely ruined those poor girls' lives. I hope... You rot in hell.
This happened to me my freshman year of college. Tinder was new, and everyone at my university was on the app. I joined to see what all the fuss was about. Looking through profiles, I found a few guys that were really interesting, and this one guy in particular caught my eye, Walter. I swiped right on Walter, and we matched. I was excited and kind of giddy because he was super attractive. He messaged me, and I got butterflies in my stomach. We messaged on the app for maybe an hour. Typical conversation is happening, and I asked him what he did for a living. He asked what my major was. Harmless conversation. After a while, he asked for my number so we could text each other instead of message on the app. I gave it to him, and he seemed nice enough. We messaged back and forth for a few days. Lots of flirty conversation and plans to hang out finally occurred. By the fourth day of conversation, he started calling me babe, which gave me mixed feelings. It was cute, but also a little weird. We didn't really know each other and had never met. I ignored it, and continued on with the conversation. He started saying he wanted to be exclusive, and he really wanted to see me in person. He was begging me at this point to come to his apartment to cuddle and watch movies with him and his dog. I told him that we would need to meet in public first. I would not be going to some stranger's apartment, and he said I was overreacting and kept begging. I ignored him for the rest of the night. The next day, he apologized and said he misunderstood. We needed to meet in public, so we made plans for that weekend. The weekend came faster than expected. And it was the day we were supposed to meet. Something just felt off, and I decided to back out. I texted him apologizing, saying my mum wasn't feeling well, and I needed to go home to help her with some housing chores. This made him annoyed, and he said, "Your mum is a big girl. If she needs, she can call you. Just come over, and you can leave whenever you go help. I really want to see you, and kiss you." I told him no. That I would be staying with my mum that weekend, and that was that. I only lived half hour away from home, so I actually did go home and see my mum that day. And after what he texted me about my mum, I began ignoring, and the texts started rolling in, text after text. Babe, I'm sorry. Babe, come over. Babe, I miss you. Are you gonna come over? I planned on replying the next day that I was busy with my mum. Then he began calling me. I had a total of forty-five missed phone calls within a two-hour period. He left voicemails saying he was sorry, and he just missed me, and wanted me to call him back. Similar voicemails continued almost the entire time I was home. My roommate texted me shortly after I finished dinner with my mum, and asked if we could go out that night. I agreed, and went back to my university dorm. Suddenly, the calls from Walter started to increase again. More texts, voicemails, and he started messaging me again on Tinder, asking why I wasn't replying to him. I wasn't planning on replying until I got a message on Instagram that said, "Why didn't you tell me you were coming back to town tonight?" Getting this message really freaked me out. I replied to him saying I was sorry that I'd been busy with my mum. How did you know I was back in town? He said, "I checked your Tinder, of course." Tinder doesn't tell exact locations, but it has a within one mile message. This really freaked me out, and I began messaging him back and said that he was being really creepy. He seriously had to be constantly refreshing my profile to see the distance change. The messages, calls, and voicemails continued. All were him now apologizing for making me feel weird about him knowing where I was. He was just worried about me. We had been texting for less than a week, less than a week, and I told my roommate about it, and we decided to stay in that night. The last straw for me was getting a message saying, "Look, I'm sorry. I'm outside your dorm with flowers and chocolate. Please forgive me." Ah,、oh, hell no! I called campus security and told them about this guy, and they never found anyone waiting outside any of the doors. I assumed he was in his car waiting for me to reply. I blocked him on all socials, phone number, deleted Tinder, and have never been back on since. I've seen him once out and about the town, but he never recognized me. Thankfully, Walter, if you ever hear this, I'm glad we never met. 
Thank you for making me second guess every single attractive guy I find. The following took place over the summer of 2016 at Wentworth Military Academy and College in Lexington, Missouri. I attended the school for their Camp LEAD program, a three to five week long summer camp designed to introduce cadets to a military style structure. When I arrived at the campus, one of the older cadets gave me a tour of the place so I would know where everything was. The first building he showed me was Hickman Hall the oldest building on the campus and rumored to be the most haunted. He showed me one of the windows on the building. There was a face drawn in dust. However, the interesting part about it is that the face is drawn in between the planes of glass. The school is located in the middle of the US, also known as Tornado Alley. Thus, windows need to be double or triple thick to ensure they don't break. The face showed up out of the blue around the turn of the millennium and no one knows who drew it. Hickman Hall is home to numerous rumors and haunted stories. For example, in 1995, one night around 3 a.m., every single door in the second floor flew open simultaneously. The doors inside are heavy weighted doors that are designed to be hard to throw open. Another time, a cadet saw a floating Civil War era general walking around and going into the closed rooms. The thought behind this is because the school is built on the grounds of the Battle of Lexington, a battle during the Civil War. Other times cadets heard a particular door slam to then discover that it had been locked and hadn't opened in years. After a point, the cadets refused to live in the building and the school built new barracks. They locked the door to Hickman Hall and no one has been in or out for 15 years. I also had my own spiritual experience at the camp. One night, I was walking back to my room after I finished running on the track with my roommate and one other cadet. As we were walking about 100 yards away from Hickman Hall, we looked at the face to see a very bright white light emanating from that room. Our first obvious thought was that it was simply a street light shining through the building from the other side as all the blinds and doors were open in the building. However, upon further investigation, we determined that could not have been it for two reasons. First was that the street lamps around the building were of a yellow nature, while this light was bright white. Second, and the more prominent reason was that the light stayed in the middle of the room, even when we walked around to different angles. The building had no power, as why would it need to? And there were no lights that hung in the very center of the room. The other cadet that was with us had been attending the school for three years, so he knew the place inside and out. He never heard nor saw anything like that before, and we didn't see anything like that for the rest of camp. I have no idea what this light was, so I'm interested to hear what you guys think. Another building I was shown on my tour was the academic building. He told us a lot of rumors about the deaths related to that building, but none of them were confirmed except for one around 1986. A cadet became very depressed and tragically ended his life in the basement of the building. He used a noose on one of the pipes in the ceiling and at his feet, at his boots, were his journal. The journal was filled with demonic drawings, poems and the like. Instead of filling the room up with concrete, the school simply locked the door and put the words, the dark room on the door. For years, cadets could hear whispers coming from the basement. And one day the imprint of a hand was found embedded in the wall on the stairs heading up. Now, some punk cadet could have done that in the night to mess with people. So I can't say 100% that it was supernatural in origin. At the end of our tour, my first roommate, of which I had two, came running out to say, hey, you won't believe what Luke just did. Shortly after Luke came running up, I explained to them why doing something like that is a bad idea. After a while, we all went inside and went into Luke's room. After a few minutes, I left, and it was just Luke and Ashton, his roommate in the room. The two of them were sitting up on their bunks and were talking about what just happened, when suddenly Ashton's chair moved a solid two and a half feet 
and his backpack, which was hanging on the back of the chair, fell to the floor. They came running out, screaming bloody murder. We went back to investigate and found all the windows and doors closed, along with the air conditioning being off when the chair moved. There was no way the wind moved that chair. It was also a reasonably heavy backpack. I can't recall how it came to happen, but I ended up looking under Luke's desk. Drawn on the underside of his desk drawer in permanent marker was a perfectly detailed Ouija board. Luke and Ashton started freaking out. We had the drawings removed as the Cada had a marker remover. For the rest of the night, they were on edge and freaked out. One of the other cadets asked me if he could walk around with my Bible, to which I gladly obliged. A week later, I moved down to the other end of the hall, in the room of my second roommate, the one who was with me when I first saw the aforementioned light. One night, two older cadets decided to use a Ouija board they drew on the lid of a tub container. At first, nothing happened, so after half hour, they put it away and went to sleep. At three in the morning, they woke up to two very loud, very distinct knocks on their door. At first, they thought it was just night watch knocking. As it's a military camp, they have a member of the Cador walk up and down the halls around two in the morning with red lens lights. They simply walk up to the door and shine the light through the window in the door to make sure both cadets are still in bed to make sure no cadets sneak out. As earlier in camp, three cadets snuck out and got extremely drunk and ended up being arrested. The red lens is to protect the eyes of the cadet and just a simple check. After a few seconds, the cadets realized the knocks did not come from the door to the hallway, but rather from their bathroom. The bathroom had no window nor any access to the outside aside from the door to the rest of the room. They were petrified as they opened up the door to find no one inside the bathroom and their door to the hallway was locked. The first thought was that it was a mouse. However, mice don't make two distinct loud knocks on doors. These are just a few of the bizarre experiences I have found during my time at Wentworth Military Academy in college. Unfortunately, the school has since closed due to lack of funding and I am no longer able to visit the campus. Years ago, when my mother was a little girl, she would have conversations with no one. It took a long time for my grandma to finally come to terms with the fact that my mother had an imaginary friend. She would sometimes wake up in the middle of the night and start talking. When my grandfather would go to check on her, he'd ask her what she was doing. She'd be staring at a corner in the dark, speaking to someone they couldn't see. They are staunch atheists and don't believe in anything, not even the paranormal, and hastily brushed off any idea that she could be talking to anyone than a made up friend. Her friend was called Barry. Years later, when I was a young girl, I started speaking to someone as well, but only when I was in my grandparents' house. My grandparents by this time obviously knew that my mum's imaginary friend was called Barry. And after about the age of eight, my mother, out of the blue, just stopped speaking to him. Well, I was about four at the time. My ability to speak was coming along quite nicely, and I was insisting that I was talking to someone. Out of a joke, my grandma asks, who are you speaking to, honey? Ari, I reply. I kid you not. My mum said that my grandparents and her face both fell into shock. She asked me again, and I repeated the same name. They all assumed it was a weird coincidence. Then my mother tried thinking back and asked me what he looked like. I described his appearance, all dark, that I couldn't see his face and that he was wearing a hat, almost like he were made of smoke, I said. My mum didn't say anything at the time, but years later, once I stopped seeing Barry, that she set me aside 
and asked me a few questions about if I remember Barry. When I tell her that of course I do, she said some things she remembered about him and tried to see if they were the same. We matched at nearly every point. She was quite afraid and asked a local priest to come bless the house. I don't have any younger siblings yet. I wonder if they'll still see Barry if they go to my grandparents' house, whatever he is. I was 15 at the time. I took about 10 of my little cousins with me to the park. Three of my older cousins, but still younger than me or the same age, came with me to help. As I approached the park, there was a man and two kids there. He came up to me and started talking to me. I tried to give him the hint that I didn't want to talk to him, but he kept on going. I asked him, oh, did you bring your kids? He nodded and kept talking. Then asked me weird questions like, are you married? Are these your kids? How old are you? I lied about my name and age and tried to walk away. Then he said, I want you to sit and talk to me. I said I had something important to tell my family first and then I joined him. I smiled and went up to one of my older cousins and said, pretend everything is fine, but we need to leave now. She nodded and I watched the two kids leave without the man. So we started walking home again and I made sure he didn't follow or watch where we went. I later found out that he had picked up one of my little cousins and put him back down again. And one of my cousins saw, but she froze and didn't say anything to me. Luckily, one of us saw him walk into a house, and so we called the police. They went into the house and found him. They couldn't charge him for anything, but told us that they've received complaints about him before. Something I left out was that I've seen him at the park before. I would go there with my boyfriend to hang out, and one time he was there just staring at me. He didn't approach or say anything to us. I'm assuming it was because my boyfriend was with me. This happened in Manitou Springs. My wife and I at the time had a long commute between work and our home. We drove to the city in the daytime came to our apartment in the evening. We had our youngest daughter at the time and were unloading some groceries. My wife saw from the corner of her eye a figure approaching. It was bizarre for her to get defensive since many tourists walked the roads we lived on, Rutan Avenue. She took our daughter inside right away, fearing something amiss. She came back out to help me and told me she felt weak all of a sudden and started pointing at this lady walking up the hill. She noticed the person did not look like someone she wanted to be in the presence of and fled inside immediately after seeing what they looked like. I, however, stayed, not knowing what I could make eye contact with. She looked homeless, which was common as a lot of people come to Colorado for the pot craze. This was different. She had a burlap sack cut in sections that almost had a weird aura, almost a memorization of confusion. Her face was scarred and deformed. She looked like she had a humpback, but possibly could have been carrying supplies. I made eye contact for the briefest moment, almost feeling an energy pushing me away. She had a staff too and was walking very slow. I got chills, turned to grab the last of the bags, and as soon as I did, she was gone. I knew she would be there, and my curiosity struck me to see what this entity was. But she vanished, poofed into nowhere, one way street with a river next to the road. I later went out to enjoy a cigarette that very night. It was two or three in the morning, very late, super dark, and no lights on the street. It was a hill, so I looked up the road and noticed up in the pass in the faint distance I could see colors changing almost like a flame burning, but not the same colors. It was more purple, blue and black. I still do not know to this day what this thing was. If it was a trick, it was well played. But the street had a very dark history. No doubt in my mind, this thing could have been a witch or demon of some sort.
Early into college, I took a class that required a team project. I didn't know anyone in the class or the area, so I was paired by the professor with a guy called Frank. Frank seemed quiet and mellow, like me, so I thought it would go smoothly. Before leaving class, we exchanged numbers and swapped ideas for the paper we had to write together. The project itself ran smoothly. We never got together outside of class to work on it, but completed it with Google Docs and occasional texts and got a high grade. I thought that would be the end of our acquaintanceship, but I was wrong. He asked me out over text and I politely told him I was flattered but not interested. Apparently that wasn't a good enough hint because he kept texting me. He would ask me out on dates or to come over to my dorm if I would tell him which one it was. At this point I was creeped out and annoyed, so I stopped answering him. The next few days he texted me. Frank would compliment my outfit that day, when I hadn't seen him the whole day, but apparently he had seen me. I felt like I was being watched everywhere on campus. He said, that green color looks good on you. Your hair's pretty today. A few more weeks passed and he started to get angry. He would text me asking me where I was and why I didn't show up for a date, things I never agreed to. I still hadn't texted him back this whole time. He'd say things like, looking forward to pizza with you tonight, catch you at the movies at seven. I definitely should have blocked him by then. He followed me on my Instagram at the time and I'd posted a picture of my cat who had unexpectedly passed away along with a caption of talking about how much I missed him. He liked the photo then sent me a two word text, meow meow. I finally blocked Frank on everything, phone, social media, the whole thing. He would friend request me once from what must have been a second account, but I quickly blocked it too. Over the next years of college, I would occasionally see him on campus. He'd keep his head down around me, but he always made me nervous after that. I'd rather not meet him again. In September of 2018, I met this guy, Andrew, through a mutual friend on her birthday. Andrew had taken an interest in me immediately, but I was kind of clueless until several of my friends said so. He began texting me a lot, and we were eventually starting to hanging out on our own. A few weeks passed by, and we started dating. And that's when things get weird. Whenever I would hang out with my friends, he'd get passive aggressive about me not spending time with him instead. One weekend, I had seen him almost every day that week, and on Friday morning we had plans to hang out as well, but I was feeling sick so cancelled. Later that night I had a Halloween party, and was feeling better, so opted to go. He got annoyed at me, saying I never wanted to spend any time with him and whatnot. Other weird things were happening, but in the end I told him I wanted to end things via text. He didn't take it well. He constantly would messaging me asking if we could meet up in person to talk, at the park, no less, and I kept saying I thought it would be best that we didn't. Then he asked my friends for my class schedule, as I was in a Julia college. They obviously didn't give it to him because they knew that he was weird and of everything that was going on. I had to skip one of my classes the next day to make my schedule for the next semester, and when I got home, my friend had told me he went to that same class. My friend didn't give him my schedule. He had went on the website where we make schedules, looked up the classes that he remembered me mentioning I was taking, and went to that classroom to basically force me into talking to him. I've never been so grateful to a skip to class. Even after that, he still tried talking to me until I eventually blocked him on everything. You're a character, Andrew, but you scared me. So let's not meet again. This is something that happened to me when I was 12, but I remember the fear I felt then quite clearly. I was visiting my dad. He lived with his fiance and her mum. I've always been very sensitive to spiritual things and they have a lot of darkness in their house. That much was clear from the moment I walk in. It was unnaturally dark inside and the air was thick and hurt my chest. 
I know that might seem insignificant to some people, but they also had very strange artifacts in their house. I can't explain what was wrong with them, but they just gave me really weird vibes. They also had a dog, a pug named Tank. He and I spent a lot of time together and he was a very friendly dog. I never heard him bark at anyone or anything, just a really chill dog all of the time. So I think my second day staying there, my dad's fiance's mum bought me a bar of soap from somewhere. Come to think of it, I'm pretty sure she said she bought it from a secret place. It was a black bar of soap called Devil's Forest. My dad's fiance was pagan. However, I get the feeling that her mum was interested in some kind of witchcraft as well. She had unusual objects in her room, like dolls and crystals and stuff. I know that witchcraft isn't inherently bad, but I did get a particularly bad feeling from her. I thought nothing of it at the time. It was just a bar of soap. It smelled nice. And so I thanked her and put it away in my room. Later on, I was the only person at home and I was playing outside with Tank the dog. And they had a really long backyard that ended on the Brisbane River, pretty much isolated with no people around. I was walking to the end of the yard nearest to the river when Tank stopped in his tracks and started barking at nothing. It was weird because I literally had never heard him bark before. I kept calling him and usually he would run right over to me, but he refused to move. I felt like he was watching something. So I went over to him to try and figure out what it was, maybe a cat or something, but he still wouldn't move and there was nothing around. He barked at an empty spot in the air, and then he just kept barking. Whatever he was staring at appeared to be moving towards the house. I honestly thought nothing of it until that second. I had left the back door open and suddenly I felt really nervous, but I couldn't explain why. I just felt like I shouldn't have left the back door open. Tank barked at the door and I ran over to it. He followed me and I quickly shut it behind myself then went upstairs and I forgot about it for the time being until I realized Tank refused to come upstairs with me where my room was. Again, he was barking at nothing. I couldn't see anything. My dad's fiance came home and was really confused as to why Tank was barking. I realized with a small sense of dread that Tank was barking specifically at my door, the room I was staying in. Trust me. There were a lot of things in that house that gave me bad vibes, but nothing compared to what I felt then. My dad's fiance remarked off handedly that maybe he could see a ghost, which didn't make me feel any better, especially since I was starting to think the same thing. I stayed up late that night playing video games and everything seemed normal until quite suddenly I felt like I knew there was someone behind me. So, Terrified, I heard floorboards creaking and I felt like whoever was there was attempting to sneak up on me, just coming closer and closer, slowly. I could feel a shiver descend my spine and I decided that I had to turn around because what if someone had broken in? I was gonna scream if I saw something because my dad's room was right there. I turn and there was nothing. Yet I felt like there was something there, right in front of me. I just knew that something was just in my face and I wanted to close my eyes, but I thought if I opened them again, then it would show itself. It was absolutely terrifying. And I ran to my room, jumped under the blankets and left the door open. I had probably the worst night in my life. The night before Tank had come and slept with me. We were together most of the time, but on this night, he simply refused to enter my room. I awoke at 1 AM, suddenly feeling very scared. I had the feeling that if I opened my eyes, I would see something terrible. I didn't know what, just that it was going to be terrifying. I stayed under the blanket, shivering in fear, feeling very, very cold. I prayed and prayed, but couldn't shake my fear. And after hours of praying 
and being paralyzed by fear. I told myself the same thing I had when I thought someone had broken in. If I see something, I'll scream and dad will come to get me. At this point, anything was better than the terror I was feeling. So I worked up the courage for about another 20 minutes to open my eyes. And when I did, I didn't see anything. However, my eyes were drawn to the black bar of soap I had left on the bookcase by the foot of my bed. I had one very clear thought, get that thing out of here. I grabbed it. And since the bathroom was right next to my room, I threw the bar of soap in there and shut the door. The sound of the soap hitting the ground was what really made me think that it was possessed. It didn't weigh much, about the same as a stick of butter, but the sound it made when it hit the tiles was so loud. I thought I had accidentally broken something, but I was too scared to open the door. I ran into my dad's room, realized it was 5 a.m. and that I had stayed up the whole night paralyzed in fear. He had to go to work, but I stayed in his room because I was too afraid to go to mine. His fiance gave me a teddy to cuddle, which was really nice. And I finally managed to get some sleep. An hour later, I got two calls, one from my mum and one from my best friend. At about 6am, I hadn't spoken to either of them since the previous day. They had no idea what happened that night. And both of them called me to ask if I was okay. I asked why. And they both told me that they couldn't sleep the whole night and that they felt something terrible had happened. I was so scared I started crying. There was no way they could have known what happened. Yet, they were both up all night feeling terrified just like me. I didn't leave my dad's room and I kept shutting the door because it felt safe. Tank was finally with me again and he stopped barking. I stayed there until my dad got home from work, but I was too embarrassed to tell him that I thought there was a demon in his house and asked him to take me home. He agreed reluctantly. And while we were packing up my things, he said, don't forget your soap. And because I was feeling much less scared by now, I went and opened the door to my bathroom to get it, which I planned to throw out the moment I got home. And I remember very, very clearly that I pegged the soap to the other side of the bathroom. So it should have landed either in or near the bathtub. But when I opened the door, it was literally right there at my feet. The only explanation is that it must have moved to the door. I freaked out, told my dad I wasn't touching the soap and went home that day and slept fine. But my mum and I both agreed when I told her the whole story that I wasn't going back there. Yesterday, I walked into a witch stall with my friend. She was genuinely curious and practiced witchcraft. I didn't mind at all. I found it interesting to say the least. As she was looking for candles, I was exploring the store. The walls were painted black with only lights dimly lit in the store. There was a section in the back where dead animals were encased in glass jars being sold. It sent chills up my spine and gave me goosebumps. About five minutes later, I noticed that my body felt cold. It was a warm sunny day in the city. Why was I freezing? And then it felt as if something slipped into my body. It was subtle. And after a few thoughts of wandering and confusion, I forgot all about it. A few hours later at home, I felt pretty tired. It was probably just exhaustion because it was a fun day walking around the city. However, I for some reason wanted to sleep early. It was 6pm. I could tell something was off, but I pushed it aside and tried to get back to sleep. I somehow couldn't. I kept tossing and turning. Suddenly I was starving. I got out of bed and asked my mum if there was anything to eat. I ate, but couldn't chew normally. Everything seemed out of place. When I walked around, everything was in slow motion. I felt dizzy and fell to my knees. I quickly picked myself up and rushed back into bed. A few minutes later, I got up again. But this time, the feeling I had was like the urge to vomit, but nothing came out. After many attempts, I had pain in my lower abdomen. It didn't feel like period cramps. 
it was so painful that I passed out. The next thing I knew, I awoke to see a needle in my arm connected to a tube leading to an IV. I was in the hospital. The doctor said I was fine, nothing was wrong with my body. I also do feel fine. Right now, I'm currently sharing this and don't feel different or sick. Was there an evil spirit in that witch store that entered my body? If there was, I hope it doesn't choose to return. I attended a small liberal arts university with a student population of 3,600. However, during the summer, this population obviously goes down considerably and the campus is mostly empty. You'll occasionally see someone who works there or a student working there during the summer, but for the most part, it's pretty deserted. The summer between my junior and senior year, I worked on campus for the teams that host and run any conferences and events that take place. The school will rent out dorms and event space for groups and students are in charge of cleaning, organizing and managing these groups for their stay. A sort of hospitality team. As part of this, we would have someone at the front desk of the main university building and any dorms which were occupied from 6 a.m. to 11 p.m. to field any questions or to otherwise help as needed. We each were required to work a certain number of shifts each week. And one of the shifts I would signed up for was 7 p.m. to 11 p.m. at the main university building. Absolutely nothing happened that night. I spent the evening catching up on the daily show. Rough job, I know. Nobody came by the center, nobody called, and we were trusted with the keys to the building. And whoever had the last shift of that evening had to lock up. As I stood outside locking the door, I heard someone ask behind me, what time is it? Having locked the door, I turned around, looked at my cell phone and replied, it's 11.01. The guy was around my age. I knew he wasn't a student. It was a small enough school where even if you don't know everyone, you generally recognized faces and you definitely knew the handful of students working there over the summer. I started to walk across campus to the dorm where they housed all the summer student workers but I only got about 10 feet before I knew something was wrong. I stopped and turned around and saw the guy following behind me and he stopped as well. I figured he could just be heading the same way so I continued walking and we played this weird game of red light green light about twice more for another 50 feet. It was at that moment I realized this was very, very wrong and he was following me. Can I help you? I asked, praying perhaps he was just lost. I'm locked out my place tonight, he replied. Not sure what to respond to that, I said. Sorry to hear that. I hope you get back in. If this isn't a classic case of girls being conditioned to be polite and non-aggressive, even in a case where they shouldn't be expected to be, then I don't know what is. I had no idea what to do, so I carried on walking. My mind was racing. I turned to look at him a few times and even directly stopped and looked at him once to let him know that I saw him. I was onto him. I felt so foolish I didn't know whether to scream or run or call someone on my phone. All of these looking back would have been much better options than just continue to walk with him following me. But it's like my brain wasn't working. I was panicking. I don't have a purse or anything so I don't think he was trying to rob me. Thankfully, I passed by a dorm that had occupants in it and my friend Mike, who was manning the front desk there the night, had decided to step out and smoke a cigarette. I had never been so glad to see someone smoking a cancer stick. Mike, hi. I started towards him. He looked over, saw me, saw the guy following me, and somehow immediately knew something was wrong. I don't know whether it was panic on my face or the fact that the guy was acting so shady but I'm glad he spotted it. I didn't even have to say anything. He just looked at me and said, oh, I'm done here. Let's head back together. Of course, as soon as he saw Mike, my follower peeled off. I told Mike what happened. And as we walked back, he kept an eye out for him, but he was nowhere to be found. I thought it was the end of it. 
However, as we walked across the campus, we saw another summer worker, Julie, walking really fast looking behind her. Sure enough, there was Creepy McCreepy person. He had moved on quickly. Julie, we yelled. As soon as he saw us, her face crumpled into the most relieved look I'd ever seen. The creeper ran away and we all walked back to the dorm together. As soon as we were inside, we were completely freaking out and getting on our phone to call campus police. When we heard the door of the dorm violently jiggling, luckily you need an access card to get inside, but whoever was out there was trying awfully hard to get in. Campus police never found him. I thank God for Mike's nicotine addiction and I don't take any more late night shifts. I continued to watch the late show though. Let me start by saying, we had a good and loving mother. She put us before anything and anyone. She sometimes worked two jobs to support the six of us. She did the best she could with what she had and what she was capable of at the time. I also know she had a personal passion for spiritual growth, the metaphysical and occult sciences. I think she was addicted to the sensation of phenomenon. I think in some ways, it opened the door to the other side. It just became part of our lives and we happily were along for her journey. When I was five years old, my big toe was cut off in some bicycle spokes. My siblings were told not to put me on the back of the bike without my shoes on. I guess my sister didn't get the memo. I was the youngest of six, four girls and one boy. I slept with my sister closest to my age, but after the accident, I couldn't be in the same bed with her because I had to sleep with this thing that helped my foot stay in place and she might have moved it in her sleep and consequently hurt me. My mother made me a cozy pad with blankets and pillows next to the couch where I could safely sleep in the living room. At that time, we lived in a townhouse apartment in Hollywood, California. It had a big living room with very high ceilings. To the left was a wide arched doorway that led to the dining room and kitchen. All the way across the archway were rolls of film strips my mother got from her job and they streamed down across the doorway like beads. Straight ahead was the staircase and under the stairs in a cubby hole was my mum's desk. To the right was a really long leather couch and my bed pad running all the way up the wall to the ceiling behind the couch were huge psychedelic zodiac posters. People thought our place was groovy, late 60s, and we all saw little things here and there, nothing really scary, more odd than anything. A few times we heard running down the stairs while we were all sitting on the couch or creaking in the hall. My sister and I saw someone who looked like our grandmother standing in our bedroom doorway for a long time, just staring at us. It was too dark to see her face. My mum told me that I spoke about seeing angels and how I said that I picked her before I was born because she was what I needed for my life. I might remember bits and pieces, but that has all pretty much faded away. But this did not. My eldest sister and I were watching The Late Show in the television room. Her on the couch and I on my pad. Everyone else was in bed. I must have fallen asleep. So she turned off the TV and covered me up and then went upstairs herself. After a while I awoke. It was so quiet. The moonlight coming through the kitchen window was shining on the film strips hanging from the dining room archway and reflected small color images on the floor. Because of this thing holding my foot still, I couldn't really move. As I was laying there, my head on my arms, my eyelids were getting so heavy. I had my arms stretched out across the floor, looking at the pretty colors from the film dancing on my little fingers. When I noticed a change, the color reflections were moving. I looked up to the archway and the strips of film were moving like a breeze hit them. I laid my head back down 
and watched them start to sway back and forth. Then, they began swaying in sync with each other. I didn't know to be scared. They kept swaying. Then all of a sudden they stopped, just like that. All of them stopped at the same time. I was very curious. I propped myself on my elbows, still laying on my back, and tilted my head. I saw a figure behind the film casting a shadow next to me. The film strips started to separate, as if someone had walked through them. It was an almost human form, but it was grey with no distinctive face. It had a male energy. I could see him as he stepped closer. I looked down, and noticed he had no feet. I looked back up at him, but instead of him across from me, now he was crouching down, two feet from my pad on the floor in front of me. I remember wondering why he had no light coming from him. I wasn't scared at that point. I simply didn't understand. He got even closer, and I leaned over my head. I innocently looked up at him. He was way less than two inches from my face. I should feel his cold breath on my nose, and drying my eyes to the point that my tears started rolling down my cheeks, and for the first time, I felt real fear. I attempted to call for my mother, but nothing came out. My heart was beating so hard and fast I could hear it. I tried to scoop my body back, but the thing holding my foot wouldn't let me. He was leaning his whole form over my little body, and I began to sweat when he started making an inhumane noise. It started out like radio static, a low chuckle into a high frequency long screech, then a pain piercing into my big toe. It felt like a long burning needle going into the bone. I wet the bed with fright, and I heard a loud ringing in my ears. Everything started to echo and spin. I remember seeing the room flip upside down as it all turned white and I passed out. I woke up to my mother cradling me, calling out, Baby, baby, are you alright? I guess she had a feeling, so she ran downstairs, but said that something told her to check on me. She never told me if she saw anything. There was blood coming out of my toe. The doctor said I must have ripped out the stitches in my sleep, even though I know I didn't move. My sister just recently told me after that happened, our mother had the apartment blessed, and that's why I never saw that thing there again. All I know is that she never let me sleep alone in the living room. In fact, after my toe healed, I slept with my mother from that point on, and she held my foot all night. This happened my junior year of high school. One of my best friends invited me to a Halloween party at her house with our school friends and some of her friends from her previous school. When I got there, I was wearing a poor iteration of Tom Cruise in Top Gun. My friend introduced me to this girl and we actually hit it off really well. She told me that my friend had told her a lot about me and that they knew each other through their parents' work. We started talking about our interests, and were decently flirting with each other. Now I had gotten out of my first, real relationship earlier that year, and I was not one to hop around from girl to girl, so being really flirty with someone on my first time meeting them was not something I was used to doing. At the end of the night, we were sitting in the ground floor of my friend's house, and we ended up kissing a little bit, which again, was moving really, really fast for me. We started texting after that, but I kind of had a weird feeling about her and couldn't really see myself being in a relationship with her. But prior to realizing that, we had made plans for a date with my friend who threw the party and her boyfriend. When the day of the date came, I had come down with an 101.7 degree fever and felt very, very out of it. I called her to explain that I was sick and was extremely sorry, but I wouldn't be able to make the date. This was a solid three to four hours before we were supposed to meet, so I wasn't pulling out last minute. Her response kicked off most of the backward period of my high school life. 
She responded by saying, Well, I wasn't going to tell you this earlier, but I have brain cancer, so I don't have much time to go on dates. The strangest part was she asked me not to tell anyone about it. She stated that this was because her father didn't want to use her cancer as a way to work people over to get stuff, which I found odd. Now, a little backstory. I had a football coach who had passed away from cancer, and my friend's mum, the friend who threw the party actually, also developed cancer around that time. So the topic of cancer was heavy on my heart, and I felt incredible guilt, and being the emotionally charged person I am, I decided to go on the date. During the date, she started saying that she really appreciated me coming and the way that I treated her. This made me feel better knowing that I was helping. At a point near the end of the date, we were walking towards my car when she again brought up that she appreciated the way I treat her. She followed it up by explaining that she wasn't used to guys treating her right because she was assaulted when she was younger and actually had to terminate a forced pregnancy at the hand of a male relative of hers. My heart broke for her as she sounded like she had endured a lot of hardship on top of the fact that she was going to supposedly pass away next year. I was an emotional wreck following the date because it was a lot for me to take in, but I knew that if all of a sudden I stopped talking to her, I would never forgive myself. At this point, I had a small sense of suspicion of things that she had told me, especially the part about not telling anyone under any circumstances. That coupled with a few other things she said to me on our date, regarding what she wanted to do with her future, saying things like, I want to try out this hairstyle when I get older. After she said these things, she seemed to tense up a bit, but I chalked it up to her coming to terms with the fact that she'd never be able to do them. My suspicions grew and grew, and eventually I decided to do some investigating. Her father was a doctor at the place where I went for doctor things, and my personal doctor was a family friend of mine who knew her father well. I asked her if there was anything I could do to support or help her regarding her cancer. My doctor looked at me and said, what cancer? She doesn't have cancer. I immediately became filled with anger and texted her telling her what I had learned. A day before, she had called me to let me know that her diagnosis was a mistake, but her tone was very melodramatic and not at all what I would expect as a response to finding out you didn't have a mortal disease. She tried to cover her tracks and was asking me why I would question her and saying, I thought you cared about me. I was livid. I blocked her on everything and blocked her number. I also fall into a pretty deep depression for the next week or two because of how much I was yanked about by this girl and this interaction led me to have major trust issues with women which I have still not gotten over. A few weeks later I get a Facebook messenger request from a name I didn't recognise. It was her. She had made up a fake profile and was telling me I was being super immature and told me that she had some explaining to do. I of course didn't answer. And that was the last I heard of her, until a year and a half later. I had signed up for an ACT retake exam at my local university. And when I got there and sat down, I looked in front of me about three seats to the right, and she was there. We ended up talking and she apologized for everything she did in a relatively believable manner, and I forgave her. I never found out any of the other things she had told me about her home life, if they were true or not and I made sure to avoid her at all costs, which was a pain because she worked at a cold stone that was two minutes away from my house, and I had to go to the one downtown, which was annoying. I came across her real Facebook profile recently, as well as she seems to be doing well, which I'm glad to see. But as far as our interactions go, let's not meet again. Recently, I had a terrible nightmare triggered by the ghost at my job, and it took me back to an event that happened in Snyder County, Pennsylvania, back between 2010 and 2015. I was between the ages of 13 to 18. 
Those five years were an absolute hell and tore my family apart. Many things happened at this house, ranging from violent enough to push my dad down the stairs to simple cold spots. However, the story I'm going to share is the night that stuck with me the most. In 2008, when the market crashed and people started losing their houses, my family was a part of it. I watched my parents struggle for a long time before finally giving up and moving closer to my school district, where we started renting the right side of a duplex. To give a bit of an image of the house, it consisted of three stories above the ground and a basement. The first floor had a closed off porch, a large divided living room, a very small kitchen and a small closed off back porch. At the kitchen entrance was the food closet and directly across from that was the door to the basement. Upstairs were three bedrooms and a full bathroom. Every room upstairs had a carpet in it, except for my parents' bedroom at the end of the hall. Yes, even the bathroom was carpeted. Through the room closet to the bathroom, my brother's room was the door to the attic. The attic was a large room that we never used and because it would open on its own accord, my brother pushed his dresser in front of it. At the other half of the house was an elderly lady and her daughter. The two fought almost every night and after they moved out, they hired a man to fix up their side and sell it. Well, he invited my parents and I over one day to tell us what he had planned to work on. So he was really letting us know that it was going to be noisy for a while. He showed us a room in the basement that was painted all black with colors painted throughout it, as well as candles and a Ouija board at the center. He had thrown that stuff out before we could even see it though. Now that you have the layout of the house, let me begin the event that haunts me to this day. It was a clear night on Wednesday, about 7 or 8 PM. My parents were a part of pool league, so they were out that night. My brother was basically living with my cousin at the time too, so I was completely home alone with three dogs and what I strongly believe was a demon. I was sitting in my father's favorite chair. The chair faced the kitchen and I was a typical teenager texting on my phone and watching TV. When I heard what sounded like the dogs getting into the garbage out in the darker than usual kitchen. This was pretty common since our boxer Max liked to pull empty bottles from the trash if we didn't give them to him. He likes to take the lids off. He'd give the caps to our two chihuahuas to play with while he played with the bottle. I yelled for the dogs to get back into the living room and out of the trash. It didn't stop the sound of rustling trash bags. So I was about to get up and go out there, but I looked down and see Max laying in front of the TV while Scrappy and Kakoa, the chihuahuas were curled on my mum's chair that faced the stairs. Sure, this spooked me a little, but I was used to this kind of thing. It became common for things to be the ghost if it wasn't the dogs. I did my best to ignore the sound and continued watching TV. However, my attention was snapped away when the light in that half of the divided living room started to dim and brighten repeatedly and fast. The feeling of being watched heightened around this time too. But again, the being watched feeling was something I had gotten used to. I began texting my mum, asking how much longer they were going to be out. She told me it wouldn't be too much longer, but I knew it wouldn't be until way later in the night. I continued to do my best to ignore it, but then it started to sound like someone was walking around upstairs in my room and in the hallway. I was not about to go investigate on my own. As a huge fan of horror, I knew that this would be unwise. Once again, I texted my mum and this time told her that the ghost was acting up and that I was getting scared. Deciding that it was getting to be too much for me, I moved to the other half of the living room where the couch was to try and get away from whatever it was. I used to sleep on the couch, so it was already set up for me to hide under the covers. I called all three dogs with me as well as an attempt to keep us all safe. I really wish I could say that that was where the event ended and that my parents came home right then and there. 
Above the half of the living room I had moved into was my parents' bedroom. In their bedroom was a very heavy solid oak dresser and a just as heavy metal framed bed. I could hear what sounded like someone pushing around the dresser and bed. It sounded like someone was rearranging my parents' bedroom. At this point, I could no longer ignore everything that was happening in the house. It honestly was as if the house was coming to life. And it was at that point I called my mum, demanding she come home because something was very wrong and there was nothing I could do to make any of it stop. I think the whole, it sounds like someone is rearranging your bedroom thing, made her think someone might have broken in. But there's no way someone could have broken in and got up the stairs without me seeing them. Even if they did find a way onto the roof and into the house, I don't think they'd be quiet enough to make it undetected with three dogs. Either way, I had no other option than to try and hide and ignore it all. What felt like an eternity passed before my parents got home, and by the time they did, everything had stopped. Once in the door, my dad went upstairs with my mum, and I closed behind. We checked every room on the second floor, only to find no one there, and nothing had been changed or moved. Well, that was scary, but the events didn't stop there. The spectre wouldn't stop touching my mum's face one night. She said it felt like spider webs all over her and she couldn't get them off. My brother and mum were home one day and my brother said, there's nothing actually here, right? To which the thing responded by opening a kitchen cupboard and then closing it. Another night, my mum had woken up from sleeping on her chair that faced the stairs. She thought Coco was coming down the stairs, so she called for him to come and join her, but the dog was already on her lap. When she looked up, the shadow coming down the stairs was gone. Every morning at 2.30 a.m., the bathroom door upstairs would open or close. This is still unexplained because it was over carpet and it took a lot of force to open or close. My grandmother had given me a doll that would rock in a circle and play music, but you had to wind it up first. One day I was just chilling in my room, minding my own business, and it started playing on its own. The attic window would open on its own too, and we never used the attic. We never used it to the point my brother pushed his dresser in front of the door like I said before. He did it to make sure the door would stop rattling. I was relaxing in the living room one night and the mudroom door was swaying and me being an annoying teen shouted, could you please stop with the door? And it stopped. My mum also demanded it leave us and the dogs alone and she heard a very clear, loud single knock upstairs. Things were quiet after a while until the other side of the house was getting renovated and then it came back worse than before. My dad was coming down the stairs one day and it looked like he got pushed. He tried to catch himself, but he slid down the stairs and sliced his foot open on the radiator at the bottom. I mean, it could have been worse, I guess. One time in the middle of the day, I was just relaxing on the couch when my sleeping dog was thrown off the chair across the room with so much force, he was spun around facing the chair just as he was sleeping on. He landed on the floor right in front of the couch. The chair was rocking so fast and hard I'm surprised it didn't flip. The poor dog was so scared he hid behind the toilet on the back porch. We took him out the house for a few hours and when he got home, he hid again. My dog also used to stare and follow things that were not there. Things would go missing too. Shortly after moving in, I would hear a voice saying my name quietly and a lot, usually in the kitchen, almost as if it were a whisper. The first week after we moved in, we heard what sounded like glass breaking, but it sounded like it was outside. So we called the cops and they looked around to find nothing. I later went to use the bathroom and found the glass around the light bulb had shattered in the sink. Not a shard of glass anywhere else. This is impossible because there were four lights above the sink stretching far enough across that the first and last bulb were not over the sink at all. The last bulb should have hit the toilet if it fell, but like I said, it was the only glass around the bulb. 
the metal was still intact and turned on. This was the first sign of there being something wrong. My whole family fell into a depression while living there, and we were constantly fighting with each other. It was never like this before we moved into that house. Sure, we all had our problems, but it was like that house escalated very negative energy. My dad tried to end his own life while living there. I tried to do the same, and my brother straight up left. And I know my mum was giving up too, because she just wanted to leave everything and go. I strongly believe that house, or whatever entity our neighbour summoned, that witch, tore my family apart. This past year was my senior year of college, and I was thrilled to be living with an alumni of my sorority who I was very close with, Abby. We weren't actually supposed to be living in the apartment we ended up in. We were originally going to be living in a townhouse with two other girls, but they started so much drama a month before we were supposed to move in that we had to contact our landlord to find a different place with their moving company to live. Thankfully, we found a two bedroom, one bathroom basement apartment in a quiet area off campus. The first month was fine and without incident, but as the days went by, some strange things began to happen in the apartment. One morning, Abby woke up to a kitchen cabinet open. She wasn't that concerned about it and figured that I had just forgotten to shut it the night before. The next morning, a different cabinet was open and once again, she shrugged it off. However, I went home one weekend and she woke up to find every cabinet in the kitchen wide open and the sink running. Needless to say, Abby was scared and spent the night at her boyfriend's. Two weeks later, we were watching TV and heard the bathroom door close. I tried to calm Abby down by saying that the fan we kept in the bathroom blew it closed. However, when we went to bed, we thought we could hear someone walking around in our living room. There's no way someone broke into our apartment and hid the whole day only to come out at night and mess with us. I was home the whole day and Abby was home from 11 in the morning. That incident took place shortly before Christmas break and all was calm in the apartment until February. Abby had gone home for the weekend and I was home alone, relaxing on the couch and doing homework. It was pretty late at night, so I turn on the TV for background noise and curled up on the couch to sleep. I woke up at 2.30 in the morning to see Abby walking through the front door smiling but not saying anything. I blinked, still groggy from sleep, and asked if she was okay. She just looked at me and proceeded to take off her shoes and walk into the kitchen. Something about her didn't seem right, like this girl looked like Abby and walked like Abby, but it wasn't her. I asked her again if she was okay because it was so early in the morning for her to be coming home. Abby looked at me and smiled and began washing something in the sink. Something inside me felt a profound sense of dread, like I was in danger and needed to get away. As quickly as possible, I went to my room and locked my door. My roommate followed me because I heard someone tapping their fingers against the door. Once, twice, Three times, four times, five times, it wouldn't stop. I didn't say another word because it felt like if I did acknowledge her, it gave her more strength. I know that doesn't make much sense, but that was my instinct. I curled up beneath my blankets and stared at my bedroom door, almost waiting for her to kick it in. My eyes felt heavy and the tapping was almost like a metronome enticing me to sleep. As I drifted back to sleep, the taps seemed to slow down to a trickle. The morning after I was exhausted, it felt like I had taken 20 Advil PM to help me sleep. But I remember everything that had happened. Cautiously, I left my room and saw Abby's bed had not been disturbed or slept in. I went to the living room and her shoes and purse weren't there. The cold feeling crept into my spine as I sent her a text asking if she'd come home that night. She said no, she hadn't and wouldn't be coming home for another two days. But then I checked the sink and the bowl Abby had been washing had been cleaned and put away. 
I firmly believe I was not dreaming or hallucinating. And I know this wasn't some elaborate prank by Abby, because she could never do anything like that. I firmly believe something took her shape that night, and its intentions weren't good. There were a few other experiences in the apartment, but nothing so drastic as what I went through that night. I was living in the Gold Coast, Queensland, Australia, last year. I was there to get some English certificates and take a break from law school. I lived in a neighborhood that's not really well regarded by most people there. It's called Southport. Coming from a third world country, I was pretty sure I could handle myself, which is pretty secure compared to where I live. Before telling you guys my stories, I feel like I have to explain why the place is thought to be dangerous by most. Southport is close to Labrador, another neighborhood, and those parts of town are well known to have a lot of drug addicts. They tend to move into abandoned places and turn them into crack houses. At least, that's what you hear. However, I think the people that tell us those things are actually trying to scare foreigners a little bit, just to make sure we're more aware of our surroundings. I mostly heard this from my teachers back in school, where I took training for my tests. So now for the first story. Most nights I would go out with my friends to hang out at Surfer's Paradise. So my daily routine would be school in the morning, and then I would go to my part-time job, go back home, work out, shower, and go out and have some fun. But one day, for whatever reason, I decided to grab some takeout at a nearby restaurant and stay home to watch Netflix. We had this burger restaurant about 150 meters from the back door of the building I lived in. And this door led to a somewhat dark street where you couldn't see a lot of activity at night. It was around 8 p.m. when I left to grab the burger and then went straight back home. But as I was returning from the store, I got this weird feeling that someone was walking behind me, which made me turn around. At that moment, I saw a guy wearing a red hoodie crossing the street. After that, I began walking faster. A few moments later, I started running to my place, thinking it was one of the crackheads that lived nearby. I must have been about 20 feet from the same back door I mentioned earlier, and I saw that weirdo run towards a garage gate and disappear. I couldn't believe what I saw. I didn't hear any noise from the guy trying to jump the aluminium gate, as it would have made a really loud noise for sure. That's when I decided to go back and check out what had happened. I left my food close to the door and started running towards the gate. When I got to the expected gate, there was an electric fence above it, which meant the guy couldn't have jumped over it. And also, I must have run back there and not even 10 seconds later he was gone. There was no way he could have opened that gate without making a noise. He simply vanished, and I'm still unsure about what I saw. This other incident is a little scary. It was my day off and I decided to buy some stuff at the nearby supermarket in the afternoon. On my way there, I crossed paths with this old man. He was wearing a black fedora and a red button-up shirt, had really dark skin and a strange moustache. He also had a cane, which didn't seem to have much use because he was walking pretty fine. When I passed by him, I felt like I got electrocuted, and for a moment, my arms felt numb. I wasn't really sure what happened, but it was bizarre. In any case, I just carried on going. This happened when I was about four or five. Among my siblings and cousins, we always said that my grandma's house was haunted. You could hear footsteps and whispers at night, and the back room would always be colder and would get a heavy, oppressive feeling. So one day, all of the older kids went to hang out, and my parents took my grandma to run errands, so it was only me and my aunt and uncle at home. They were cleaning the backyard, and I was playing with toys in the dirt. For whichever reason, I can't remember, 
I went inside and went into the back room, which was my grandma's at the time. As I stood there, I remember that heavy feeling starting to creep in. There was a big window that I looked out into the backyard, and I decided to go to it. As I moved the curtain, I could see this really old trailer that sat in the backyard that was used for storage. The doorway would have only been about five feet from the window. As I looked out, I immediately noticed a figure in the doorway of the trailer. It filled most of the doorway. It was dressed in a long black dress with like a turtleneck, the dress being super black. I don't think I've ever seen such a pure black in my life. It had a bald, round wrinkly head with tall pointy ears. Think of the goblins from Harry Potter and the hands ended in long sharp talons. All the skin of this thing was really sickly, this shade of green, and it just stood in the trailer staring back at me. Then it began to shake its head and index finger as if to say, no, like you'd tell a little kid. After that, it slid out of view and the heavy feeling lifted. I don't recall what I did after that, but I don't remember feeling scared, more confused, I would say. I had forgotten about the event until years and years passed, when the siblings were sitting around reminiscing after my grandma passed, and my sister said she remembered seeing something similar. She said she also saw a woman in a long red dress and a pumpkin for a head, sitting by the water fountain or bird bath. The house isn't in the family anymore, so I can't say that something else happened, but we all suspect that there was a witch residing in or around grandma's house. Me and my family live on a big farm, out in the outskirts of a town. We often have friends come over and play games like manhunt in the surrounding area. An important detail to note is that the farm is pretty much open. Anyone can waltz in, but most people don't, obviously, as it's private property. Well, one day we're playing manhunt. It's about the middle of the day, and we're running around the place screaming. That's when we hear an unusual scream coming from the direction of the willow tree. We run over and get underneath its branches that actually hide someone from being seen. My cousin, who is about 16, is screaming. There's a man who is literally chasing her. We all look around and we see him stalking the edge of one of the fields. We start freaking out. My cousin says that she was hiding behind another tree and he came up from behind her, put both his hands on his shoulders and said, this isn't gonna hurt. And she just kicked and ran, but the man was persistent. She had no idea what his intentions were, but she didn't want to find out. We got inside, called the police, and when they arrived, he was gone. From that day forward, we looked into getting some serious security. Gates, cameras, it just wasn't worth the risk anymore. So some context. I have never really been in a long-term relationship. I've dated a girl a bit, but I haven't dated a guy, and I've never slept with either. Like anyone else my age, a 20-year-old female might do, I started swiping on Tinder to try and put myself out there. I like to think I'm not naive and pretty intuitive about people, but I wasn't perceptive about this guy at all. Jake and I swiped and matched each other two days ago. Jake's first message, was telling me that he wanted to meet me and my dog, and he thought we were both cute. Liking his directness, I said we should meet up. The night the first red flag waved was when I didn't answer him back immediately, and he messaged me, asking if he was detecting negativity. Chalking it up to nervousness, I apologized and explained why I didn't answer, and all was good. Then we planned to meet up last night at the bar. Flag number two, was when I arrived at the bar. It's important to note, in this state I live in, any place selling liquor can't let anyone under 21 in. I didn't know this and had been reassured by Jake that I could get in no problem. 
Of course this wasn't true. Luckily, seeing my birthday was just in a week, the bouncer let me in anyway. And within minutes, Jake was at the bar too. Meeting this guy, he seemed normal. Red leather jacket, chucks, typical normal dude. He orders me a gin and tonic and one for himself and we settle in and talk. He tells me about his life. He's rich and his family and I do the same. We play pool at one point. So I put down my drink and this is when things start to get a little bit blurry. I can't remember most of our conversation up until we happened to get back to my place. I remember us leaving, getting into his car and us getting near to my place. You have to understand I don't drink much, but one drink does not get me drunk. I don't do hangovers and I barely ever brown out. I never black out. This is important to note. Once in my town, we decide to go to a nearby market to pick up food. As we are there, red flag three occurs. Seeing someone I thought I knew, I told Jake I was gonna say hi. He awkwardly backed away and he stood outside at this point, awkwardly backing away and refusing to meet her. I was wrong though. I didn't know the girl and soon rejoined him to walk to my place. As we open the door, my roommate Maddie opens the door. We say hi, talk a little, and she mentioned she's about to take a shower. Jake at this point creepily makes a ooh sound. Maddie, who is also tipsy at this point, mentions some guy wants to do me. No biggie, it's the way she rolls. But after his expression and the realization of how tired I was and how drunk, I say he should go. And he does with no attempt at any physical contact. This is where the story should end, but it doesn't. Within minutes, this dude blows up my phone with messages, saying he's more open-minded like my roommate, calling me boring, implying I'm not attracted to guys and saying that he felt no chemistry and he hoped we could have cuddled at least. I show my roommate who gasped, me not getting the full meaning of the open-minded context, remember I'm drunk, and ask why he's so shocked. Finally, I get it. He's implying he wants to sleep with her and that she is more open to it than I am. Just so creepy. At that point, I'm freaking out slowly realizing how I'm acting and feeling. Putting together how one drink shouldn't make me feel this way, I realize I might have been slipped something. Maddie and I go to the local police. We report it and I decide not to get tested. I couldn't explain why. But until you're in my position, possibly drugged at 3 a.m., embarrassed and worried you're wrong, worried you might be charged for underage drinking, it's a lot harder than it looks to go through the whole process. The story ends like this. He's blocked. I'm terrified because he knows where I lived and with me sleeping off whatever was in my body. Jack, please don't do that to a girl again and let's never meet. You're so gross. This happened during my final year in college. I took a fun class called theater in LA which is basically a class where you watch different plays once a week all over LA. Since the theaters are all over the place and not everyone had a car, the professor organized a carpool system you could volunteer into. I know what it's like to be carless in LA, so I volunteered to drive someone around and I got partnered with Bob. It started out okay. He really made himself comfortable in my car, changing the music nonstop and going through my glove compartment, snacks and water without asking me, but whatever. I've met a lot of people with boundary issues before. Things started picking up when we found out we had the same taste in music. We got talking. I mentioned I had a fake ID and he mentioned he smoked up. I mentioned I wanted to try weed, but I haven't had the opportunity to as I'm non-American and only moved to the US for college. Too nerdy to get invited to fun stuff. And so far, so good. Then my mum called. I had to answer, since my mum is the type who would keep calling until you'd answer. My car has one of those Bluetooth speakers, so he could hear the entire conversation. But my mum and I were speaking in Indonesian, so I didn't care. At random parts of the conversation, he'd start giggling and it was making me really self-conscious. Did he think I sounded funny? 
After I hung up, I asked, What's so funny? <laughs> nothing. Okay, so now we're driving in an awkward silence. Then he started making this weird hee hee noise. It was a cross between a bray and a wheeze and a giggle. I asked him if he was okay, if he was having an asthma attack or something. He said it was fine, and at random parts of the drive he'd laugh on his own and make that weird noise. Things are getting weird now. We finally arrived at the theatre, and I quickly talked to the other people to get away from him, then realised loudly he yelled, Hey, take your fake ID out and buy me booze. Why are you yelling that out loud? Come on, buy booze, buy booze. This girl quickly rescued me by dragging me to the bathroom with her. Apparently he was harassing her earlier for cocaine. She doesn't do coke or even said anything about it. He met her for the first time ever, and the first thing he said was, Hey, do you have coke? Anyway, the play was over close to midnight, and it was time to go home. Bob went, Hey, do you want to find weed? Drive us downtown and let's look for some. No, I'm not driving downtown in the middle of the night. I told him no, and he kept on whining and chanting. This was before medical marijuana was legalized, so I kept telling him to shut up. During the car ride back, he kept alternating between whining and chanting, let's get weed, and I want to stop at a food joint, and laughing randomly on his own. Thanks to the jam trying to get out of the movie theatre, it was past midnight, so I was exhausted. I was in no mood to eat, even if he were normal, and I kept telling him that I had plenty of snacks in the car, and he could help himself to, which he did, but he wouldn't stop whining. I just ended up turning it all out, but he never stopped. I was so relieved when I dropped him off. The next day was Saturday, and I was woken up by a phone call. It was Bob, since he had my number as we were carpool buddies. Hello? I had no idea why he was shouting. There was no noise in the background. Buy me booze. You have fake ID, you need to buy me booze. What the hell? He woke me up for that? I was half asleep, told him very bluntly to piss off. After that, I constantly got calls from Bob at random times, including the middle of the night. Most of them would just be asking for a free ride or booze or whatever. He wouldn't stop laughing. He wouldn't say anything, he'd just laugh. He had various different laughs too. The evil scientist, the cartoon villain, the Mickey Mouse on helium laugh. And I know this sounds comical, but I was petrified. The weirdest call I got from him was at 2am. He went, hey, I found a storage container on campus. I'm in it now. Join me. He tried asking me where I was on campus so we could hang out, but obviously I didn't tell him. He actually replied with, I'll just follow you back next time. Which doesn't sound that creepy, but with Bob saying it, I thought he'd be wearing a shawl made of entrails soon enough. Obviously I had to end this arrangement, but I was scared of getting on his bad side since he was giving me mentally unstable vibes. I lied and told him that my very conservative Asian parents were worried about me driving alone at night with a strange man, so they insisted on me carpooling with a family friend instead. Out of desperation, I went to the only person in class I sort of knew and also had a car, Steve, and I explained the situation. Steve is someone I've met once at a party, but luckily he was awesome, and he agreed to back up my story and drive me to the theatre for the rest of the semester. Luckily for me, Steve happened to be Asian too. So the story seemed believable, because yes, Bob questioned me about it. Steve also happened to be really buff and made sure he always placed himself in between Bob and me. So Bob kind of left me alone after that. I blocked Bob's number, told him I changed it, and conveniently kept forgetting to give it to him. Bob apparently had a hard time finding another carpool buddy. Everyone found him creepy and no one lasted more than one ride with him, and eventually stopped coming to the class. I think the professor failed him too. I do feel bad because I think the guy may have some untreated mental issues or a drug problem, but that dude really scared me. There's a very strong presence in our home, and it was here last night. Let me give you some backstory. It first started three months ago. Our four-year-old's first night here 
had an imaginary friend, and he's never had one before. I remember specifically feeling the presence before he started talking to seemingly no one. Frightening. It was like whoever this was was minorly playing with him. A small interaction. But at one point I heard him ask, do you want something to drink? And then proceeding to bring me a drink and ask me to open it for him. I watched. He never took a drink of it. Our thermostat would somehow be changed when my boyfriend would be back here without me. His coffee pot also kept getting shut off by the switch at the back. It wasn't me doing it, and our child couldn't reach. I at one point even paid $13 for a list of previous people that lived here to search for obituaries. It came up empty. We live in the state of Oklahoma. So you're allowed to not disclose to tenants if someone has passed away there. Two months of living there, whatever this thing was definitely started to show a stronger presence. It often appears childlike, but at other times it does not. Things get turned off quite often. The fan, the TV, our speakers in our bedroom, things fall off the wall a lot. It could be a coincidence, but it usually happens only on the nights when my boyfriend and I are together. I've tried to pay attention to the patterns. There've been a couple of points where it sounds like there's someone rolling a ball across the attic. My boyfriend experiences a lot of sounds. He'll be in the shower before I'm home from work and have to get out because he thinks he hears our son crying or screaming at times. I also see shadows, shadows you can't see through more of a dark figure. I often feel as if someone is peeking around the corner looking at me. And when I look, something moves so fast, my eyes barely catch a trace of it. Throughout the last three months, we've both also been experiencing terrible dreams, so vivid, so real, all nightmares. We even once burnt sage. Everything calmed down, and I felt as if this was when the entity started showing itself to me more as a child. In the now, we had been talking to a friend on the phone about this, and she was stressing her concern about how it seems as if this is something very dark. The dreams have been persistent since we began speaking to her. I feel as if this is angry, like it's been called out. Things keep falling off the wall while we're sleeping. I also felt as if something kept making my dreams go dark and I would wake up with a jolt and one time could feel such a strong presence that I couldn't move. Also, our son's teddy bear has vanished into thin air. He hasn't taken it anywhere and it's not here. I've searched the house from top to bottom. The cars, the garage, around the house. It simply isn't here. Not to mention, the attic is one of the closets that it's screwed shut. All of the carpets in the house are old. There's even carpet in the bathroom and kitchen. But there's new carpet, funnily enough, in the bedroom closets. I'm not sure what this entity is or what it wants, but I don't think its intentions are as innocent as it makes out. My fiance and I are camping, as we've done many of times in a particular state park that we enjoy. Everything was normal. We made some dinner on the fire, stayed up a bit, and then let the fire die down and went to the tent to smoke. Despite listening to at least 100,000 of these Reddit stories, the woods never scared me. This night though, was the night my brain decided that a reoccurring nightmare about someone walking around our tent would be a good idea. So I'm going through these cycles of dreaming that I've woken up to footsteps around the tent and try to wake up my fiance. Fail, dream it again, and eventually wake up completely to realize there's nothing there, right? Three or four rounds into this mess and I wake up to the footsteps again. This time I realize I'm not dreaming. There are definitely footsteps. Then I hear a deep, low throaty growl and I'm nearly petrified. 
I managed to reach over and wake my fiance, whispering quietly, There's something outside our tent. He wakes up, and we continue to hear something walking around the tent, growling and snarling. We're wetting ourselves. We can't decide if it's something big, because by the vocalizations, it sounds it. But I'm hoping the footsteps are just amplified, as they generally are in the woods. And maybe this is just a really aggressive squirrel in a trench coat or something. We're trying to peek out, but can't see anything. The noise has moved to the edge of the site, and there's a lot of snarling and animals screaming. Then silence. Then it's on the other side of the tent. It's making it really hard to decide what to do. We're both trying to be silent while gathering what little feeble weapons we have. Me and my pink canister of saber pepper gel, and him a few weapons that we brought to cut bits of rope and carry in case of emergencies. We don't even have the hatchet because I let him pack while I was at work, which means we had about 85% of the important things we needed. I did this to myself. Clearly, we are doomed. There's some screaming going on along the edge of the site now. It sounds like every small animal in the northeastern United States is being skinned alive around our tent. I'm shaking like a leaf, no exaggeration. And I had to stand because the adrenaline pumping felt like I smoked a Bobby Brown's lifetime worth of crack. We still cannot pinpoint where this thing is, what it is, or catch any glimpses from our tent. We are definitely done for in the woods here. It's late in the season, and there's maybe one other occupied site, and we showed up too late to even check in. So no doubt, we're about to be a couple of unidentifiable mystery malls, and I'm losing my mind because I have a kid. Finally, it's been a few minutes since we heard any shrieks or growls. Last we heard, this thing sounded like it were a few sights away. And so we're gonna grab our wallets, leave the supplies, and get out of here, and make a run for the car. We zoom the hell out of there. It's 2 a.m. and we get some Slim Gins at a convenience store. We go home for the night, gear up in the morning with some high power CO2 weapons, hatchets, knife, you name it, and we go back. We didn't find anything. We made friends with a troop of tubby trash pandas for the rest of the trip, and kind of always wondered if, you know, perhaps it was actually just our three raccoons in a trench coat terrorizing us that night. I'll never know. And it's better that way. My great-grandmother Emily owned a house on Glenwood Avenue in Owasso. She was fairly well off, so she let my mum's mother move into her house when she was falling on hard times with her husband and their kids. And my great-grandmother Emily moved out. I'm going to try to make this as easy to understand as possible, to who is who. So I'm going to lay out who moved into the house first. My grandma Pat, who is my mother's mother, has three kids. Charlotte, my mother, Chris and James. She was married to a man called Butch, who also had three kids. Sandy, Lee and Greg. These are all events that my mum and grandma Pat both separately told me throughout my life. I'm 22 now and have told my friends about them through the years. I've been hearing these stories for a while, and think it's time to share these experiences. I want to give a bit of information about my great-grandma Emily when she lived there. She told my grandma that some strange things had been happening in the house when she was in bed. It felt like a cat walked over her, and she had no animals. She told my grandma that something would tug her blanket at the end of her bed, when she would have to clutch onto it to keep it there or it would be pulled off. Water would also run in the bathroom constantly and she would have to get up and turn it off throughout the night. My mum moved into the house and she made some friends around the neighborhood. They would tease her about how a witch lived there before and did witchcraft in the basement and said the house was haunted. My mum brushed it off thinking they were trying to scare her. My mum said, that her and her stepsister Sandy shared a room, and she said that red glowing eyes would look at them in the closet. My mum said, 
They would be so scared that they would sleep in the same bed, and Sandy even ran and flicked on the light and moved the toys around in the closet, thinking it was just a light. But as soon as the light would flick back off and Sandy got back into bed with my mum, they would reappear. My mum told me that they would pull long black hairs from the drywall leading to the staircase and that the drywall would literally just crumble. She also told me that one night my grandma Pat was waiting for her husband Butch to get home. She was watching TV in the living room and she was laying on a pull out bed. She sat up to get a drink of water and had her feet on the floor and something grabbed her ankle and squeezed. It shook her so hard from underneath the bed that it left a bruise. She looked under the bed thinking it was one of the kids and she saw nothing was there. So she yelled for my mum to come out with her until her husband got home. She told my mum what happened and they were both terrified. I asked my grandma about this and she told me the exact same thing. My grandma also told me that she'd seen large black figures in the home multiple times. I just got off the phone with my grandma to try and get everything as accurate as possible. She didn't have much time because she was at work, but she did tell me that a man hung himself in the basement and that she would see things in the kitchen a lot, like large black figures. The basement door was in the kitchen. She said that my mom would too, to the point that she would scream and cry multiple times from the ages of two and a half and told me that they moved out once when my mum was younger because of the weird stuff that was going on and someone else moved in for a while, but they had to move back several years later, which was when she was grabbed from under the bed. She said something grabbed her by the ankle and shook the hell out of it. My great grandmother Emily owned the house the entire time, which is why they ended up back there. She also said that her son James had seen the red glowing eyes and all of the other kids would hear and see things constantly. But after things got physical with her and it grabbed her ankle, she got out of there for her own good. She also said that renters wouldn't stop moving out of the house very quickly until someone purchased it years later and it had been blessed. She thinks they're still living there to this day. When I was around 15, my mum told me about this again because it was so scary and interesting to me. I would have my mum retell me everything that happened in the house all the time. And I ended up finding the house online while I was searching through articles to see if any information was available about it. I found that right down the street was Rosevare Park and Woods, and is said to be one of the most haunted places in Owasso. I'm not sure if it has any correlation with the house, but I just thought it was strange. I'm going to tell you about my first boyfriend. He was my first kiss and also my first abusive relationship. We started dating when I was a preteen. He was super attentive and protective of me from the very beginning. It wasn't until the fifth month when I started noticing the alarms going off in my head. He had taken me on a cute roller skating date and we had sat down for a bit to take a break when two of his friends showed up. At this point, the vibe from him was no longer safe. The smile he had five minutes beforehand was replaced with a look of pure hatred. He switched into this odd predator mode and told me to kiss him with tongue in front of his friends. I told him that I was just not ready to do something like that and especially not in front of other people. He didn't like that answer and pulled my face to his and started forcing his tongue in my mouth. I was a pretty small girl, but luckily I was able to push him away long enough to start running towards a more populated part of the skate rink. I told him to stay away from me while I waited for my mum to pick me up. I didn't tell my mum what happened because I was in shock and confused. I was young and didn't want to get into trouble for kissing a boy. So I decided to just ignore him until I was able to process everything. A week of successfully avoiding him at school passes when he worked up the nerve to try something again. He found me surrounded by a group of friends and decided to try his luck. 
I didn't even notice he was there until we were practically bumping elbows. Being that close to him definitely put me on edge, and I nearly defecate myself when he started to speak to me. It was all pointless small talk, until he realized I wasn't in the forgiving mood when his mood shifted like before, and he was just staring at me like I was the most disgusting human on the planet. I was holding one of those old portable CD players when he yanked it out my hand and started trying to shove it in his bag in an attempt to steal it. I yelled at him to give it back and tried prying it from him, which apparently took offense to him because he punched me in the face with enough force to drop me to the ground. I obviously started crying and we were both sent to the principal's office. His dad was the football coach in that Midwestern community. So he was able to talk the principal into only requiring his son to attend detention once for punishment. We didn't see each other too much after that and thankfully ended up going to different high schools. Then I run into him at Taco Bell drive through my sophomore year. I didn't realize he was the cashier until I was at the window about to pay when we made awkward eye contact. I pretended to not recognize him and hurried with the transaction until I was able to speed away. Unfortunately, he saw our chance meeting as a sign of fate and attempted to send the equivalent of you up to my Facebook profile. Unfortunately, I can never unsee his ultra cringy attempt at flirtation. I think I saw you at Taco Bell today. I was the cashier. You're pretty cute. And I was wondering if you wanted to send some pics. My response was an immediate block. And I made sure to let my sister know about the incident because I just had to tell someone. If I had known then just how dangerous this teenage boy would become, I wouldn't have taken any of the incidents so lightly. But I'm not psychic. And after some awkward laughs, I moved on with my life and continued to date less rubbish people. Fast forward to today, when my sister sends me an article from her local news report featuring my dear first boyfriend's picture. Apparently, he decided to attack someone with a large weapon in the throat at a popular venue when they tried defending a woman he was physically attacking. We dated nearly 10 years ago but I still can't shake the feeling that I definitely dodged a bullet. It's a strange feeling when you realize that dangerous people are weaving in and out of your life without you even knowing before it's too late sometimes. According to the comments in this article, he had a habit of assaulting the women in his life and had a history with obsessive stalking. I imagine justice will be served swiftly due to the manner of the crimes and overwhelming evidence supporting a case against this psychopath. I hope we never meet again. When I was a freshman in college, I lived in one of the oldest buildings on campus, built around 1891. The campus had originally been a teaching college for young women, and for some time when a young girl named Florence was attending the school during World War I, she had been involved with a young man at the time who had been drafted to fight overseas, and he promised to keep in touch with Florence. They had written letters to one another over time, but the letters from Florence's lover had slowly stopped over the course of a few weeks. During this time, Florence became desperately depressed. At the time that she was living in the building, there had been a sunroom on the fourth floor that had several beams across the ceiling. Florence also lived at the very end of the sunroom. During her depression, Florence sadly took a rope and used it to hang herself from the end of the ceiling at the sunroom. Not long after, Florence's lover returned home safely, only to hear of Florence's passing. He returned to her hometown and then ended his own life in the hopes to being reunited with his love. Fast forward almost a century to 2011. I was moving into my room for the first time, and I happened to be in the same building that Florence had lived in, at the base of the stairs that led up to her old room. The entire building had been renovated in 2003. The sunroom was closed off, 
Florence's room became a storage room, and the fourth floor was separated into two wings, one for women and one for men. My roommate finally made it, and we both began to settle in, and make friends with our neighbours. We had eventually brought a group of our friends to hang out with us, just outside of our room, amongst some of our neighbours, when one of our friends asked if they could do a seance in our room, considering how near our room was to Florence's old room. I looked to my roommate not knowing what to say. She was okay with it, eventually, but didn't stay for the whole seance. We created a Ouija board out of a piece of paper and used a pencil as the planchette. We didn't get many responses, however the scariest part was everything that happened the night after everyone left. My roommate decided she wasn't comfortable staying there that night and stayed with some friends for the night and a few nights following. I stayed back. A few hours after I went to bed, I was awoken to the sound of branches breaking right by the head of my bed. I sat straight up and started to look around the room to see what could have made that sound and had noticed that my roommate's message board had detached from the wall. It slid down the wall and landed on her desk as soon as I saw it detach. The worst part was the message board was on the complete opposite end of the room as the head of my bed, and I heard the cracking right next to my head. I immediately texted my roommate about what happened, and never played with a Ouija board in that room again. This takes place in La Pateca, which is a rural area just south of Monterrey in Mexico. When I was a little girl, we always had legends of the witches in the wild. Don't go out alone. Don't stay out so late at night. If you do, the witches will come and take you away. My mama would tell me and my brother Armando every day. Mama would not let me or Armando go anywhere unless it was both of us. And the furthest we could go was the little store a mile away when we needed groceries. We were not well off with money, so we had to walk everywhere. When Armando and I got done working the fields, Mama would let us play until it was night time. Sometimes we would play tag with our friends. Sometimes Papa would chase us around or take us exploring in the woods. The exploring was fun because we got to see animals, but we also saw the little old huts where the witches lived. Everyone called them the witches because they were weird and would constantly do black magic and talk to themselves. One day, Armando and I were playing alone because Papa was tired from working on the field all day and Mama was making supper. We went to the woods and started to explore, but we went too deep and got lost. I cried and cried because I wanted Mama, but nobody heard us, so we kept walking around. After a little bit, an old lady heard us and said she would help us. No, you're a witch and you're going to take us away, yelled Armando. No, no, mijo. I know where your mummy and papi are, she said. I cried and told Armando that I wanted to go home. So he gave up and told the lady to help us. Okay, follow me. After a while, she took us to a house we didn't know but said Mama and Papa were inside, so we went. Without thinking, we went in, and the lady suddenly grabs us and starts carrying us, screaming, into another room. She threw us in and locked the door. Armando kept banging on it and yelling to let us go, and I just cried and cried. It was quite quiet, but I thought I kept heard her saying, Glory to God. He has given me pure, blood of the innocent. With this, I'm going to seek my revenge against those who have done things to me in the past. I don't exactly remember how much time passed because I was tired after crying for so long. According to Papa, we were not home, so he went around town looking for us until he came into the woods to look. He said he stopped at the house where we were at because something made him look there. When Papa called out to the house inside, the witch kept yelling at him to go away, but he said he thought he heard Armando, so he broke in to look around. He found us 
and said he heard banging which showed him where we were. When he found us, he hugged us and took us away, telling her that if he ever saw her near the house again or the kids, he would end her. Mama was crying so hard when we saw her that it made me cry again. Papa yelled at us for being dumb and going out so far, and Armando just looked at the floor. After that, Mama didn't let us go out anymore without her or Papa until we were teenagers. Every day I thank God for not letting me and Armando get into more danger that day. I do not know what the witch wanted to do to us, but I don't think I want to know either. When I was 15, a friend and I went for a lot of walks around town. Small town, around five to 6,000 people. We're going to this cyber cafe to meet a few friends, and we often took different streets to get places, just to keep it interesting. We were about to go to the main street off one of the side streets, and a man on a bicycle approached us. He got off his bike and asked a couple of questions. Something didn't seem right about him. He was mid forties, and we both kept inching away, but didn't want to come off as rude. So we answered about the weather or traffic. Then he paused and we said we had to go. And he said, you look so young. I don't want you to get in trouble, but I need to touch someone. I just need to touch you. You should come with me. I just felt terror overtake me. I couldn't speak. I grabbed my friend's hand and turned. We sprinted the rest of the way to the cafe, and as soon as we were inside, we used the phone. I called my mum to pick us up while my friend told the co-worker what happened and what the guy looked like. A month later, I received my first cell phone. My mum suddenly passed a few months ago, and within a day of her passing, my wife and I constantly finding dimes at our feet in all kinds of strange places. Here's an example. When we talk about her, sometimes within minutes, we'll find a dime on the floor or a counter that wasn't there before. I had shoveled snow off my front step last week. And after I was done, I could clearly see there was absolutely nothing on the step as I swept it after shoveling it too. And within two to three minutes, I turned around to pick up the shovel and turned back around to see a shiny dime sitting on the step. My wife started keeping the dimes, and oddly enough, some of the years coincide perfectly to the years of our births. And trust me, I'm only telling you a few stories, but there are probably at least 30 to 40 strange appearances of dimes since her passing a few months ago. Could this be significant? I was in a mall in Indonesia, and two tourists seemed to be having problems communicating with the cashier at a bookstore, so I helped translate. They wanted to buy me drinks to thank me. I told them it wasn't necessary, as I had to go back to my mum soon. They told me to meet them for dinner, and I told them I have to have dinner at home. They told me to sneak out and meet them after dinner. At this point, a bookstore staff noticed something was wrong, and went up to question them. My sister and I dashed off while we were distracted. We continued wandering around the mall and realized they were following us. And to see if we were just paranoid, we ducked into a lingerie store since we figured two men wouldn't usually need to go into one of these places, and they followed us in. We ran so quickly back to the jewelry store our mom was at. The store, thankfully, had intimidating security guards, and I guess that stopped these guys. For context, I was 11 and my sister was 10. 